investment uh, banking results being up three to four percent and that was viewed very positive and part of this jump that we've seen um, consumer spending by their customers was up uh, six percent year over year and RBC moved their target up just a couple days ago I think from 35 to 38 so this is an outlier call Scott uh, time will tell if this particular analyst is right I thought it was odd also that the call came out at like nine o'clock last night I don't see a lot of calls coming out, um, upgrades or downgrades, um, that far after the market has closed. Uh, so uh, again, there's a lot of interesting things about this particular call, and time will tell. I would not be getting out of Bank America based on this call. Is it time, anybody think it's time to reassess where, where some of these names have gone, BAC included? Look, I began the show by talking about selling out of Capital One, that's consumer finance. The reason I did that is I just have too much financial exposure with JP Morgan, uh, KKR, Wells Fargo, USB. So there was just too much exposure. I don't like what we saw from ISM manufacturing. I don't like what we saw from yields, and that directly lends you know, Boeing, into financials. You know Boeing's in that number though, right? The ISM manufacturing? I'm going, it is, it is. But I'm going to stay committed to these financials. I'm gonna listen, I think trading revenue you on a comp basis is going to be very strong in the coming quarter. So I want some flexibility. I want to be able to take a look at maybe a Goldman Sachs or a Morgan Stanley or a T. Rowe Price or a Schwab or something of that nature on a pullback. I just wanted to create a little bit of uh, cash in the sector. How about the banks? Yeah, so we're neutral financials right now. And I think that the call and what we would agree with is that it's a relative story. So looking for those banks um, that are best able to execute, that have the best grip on technology, tech spending is a huge part of the financial sector and Although, that's one of the I'm thinking back to what you said at the top of the show yeah. though if you're you know if you're neutral on financials how can you be neutral on financials if you're positive on small caps which are dominated by financials So that is true so within our, when we're thinking about sectors, we talk about our sector strategy, which is a U.S. large cap um, strategy, and within that, we are neutral to financials. Um, but I do think that the momentum you're seeing from the economy will help those smaller companies, and yes, the small cap does have more of that financial, more of that industrial bend, more of that value type of exposure. Um, we think that will do well in a, an economy that is not going to see a recession over the next 12 months, which is our base case. I'll give you a financial here that uh, we don't talk about enough. It's just broken out. I think if, if the financials stay weak for a couple of days, it'll retest that breakout at about 220. The Berkshire B shares. Here is, in my view, one of the most perfect ways, if you're bullish on banks, but you want a little bit of a hedge, Berkshire has $130 billion in cash. In addition, massive stakes in every major bank, including Wells Fargo, which is its biggest, but also Goldman Sachs, etc. U.S. Bank Corp. Uh, U.S. Bank. They own all the best ones. So you've got, here you've got a company trading on a market multiple, 20 times earnings, with, I think, 20% of its, of its uh, market value sitting literally in cash, waiting for something to happen in the market where they can actually deploy that cash. So it's almost like a built-in hedge. In the meanwhile, insurance operations are doing just fine. Um, and and, and they, they have this put where they have raised the limit at which they're willing to do uh, stock buyback. They've barely done any. They have this authorization, they just don't use it. If there is a big market event, all that cash, they can pretty much have the flexibility to do whatever they want. Everything from an incredibly um, poignant uh, acquisition to a massive buyback. Um, so I really like this name. I like the fact that it's broken out. And even if this breakout fails, I still think stocks should hold up better than the financial sector. Um, and so for that reason, I would bless this right here. Uh, Scott, uh, to Joe's point about ISM, ISM, Joe, is going away. And the reason I say that is even though it's a long, it's been around a long time, Scott, the other, the market uh, group, they do theirs with a forward look that they weight more heavily to Josh's point when Joe says, well, the ISM was bad. And it was for ISM versus the ISM. Are we still but, talking about the banks or what are we Well, doing? we are because consumers and how they feel about the economy are influenced by things like ISM and market, M-A-R-K-I-T. No, they're and, not. 
I think they are. Yeah, find me a consumer on the street who knows what ISM is. Well, I mean by what the actual numbers are. So to your point, uh, what's happening with ISM is that the ISM says, hey, things are slowing down. This is the worst in five months. Meanwhile, consumers are spending like crazy because that's measuring the past. So they're not as market measures, measures the future. I'm saying they weight that more heavily, Scott. That's why I say it's going away. Manuf- because who Wait cares about what's in the rearview mirror? You're Manuf- suggesting Manuf- the ISM manufacturing, manufacturing is- miss? Yes. Is a it's of because of what Josh spending? said. No, it's because of what Josh said about Boeing. And that's because it's from everything up to that point. It's not the forward look. So if you asked those same people, because these are both diffusion indexes, right? If you ask those same people from the ISM, what's your forward look? That's what market does, and that's what gets weighted more heavily in theirs, and that's why it's at records and keeps moving up rather than the negative that you get out of ISM. I'm just saying, watch. Watch this one. Okay. Six months from now, a year from now, we won't be talking about we're ISM. Doing that, but Coming up, some options bulls are making bets on a mid-cap <laughs> energy stock. But John's latest trade is up next in unusual activity, but first, to check on the S&P sectors, we're back after this. Do you have concerns about mild memory loss related to... Boredom. Fitness enemy number one. So don't just run. 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 Mix it up. Skip. Run. Skip. Run. Give yourself a lift. Mix Mix it up. Lift. Mix it up. Run. Lift. Splash. Skip. Lift. Run. It's crunch time. Skip. Mix Mix it up. Run. Mix it up. Add a boxing class. Skip. Run. Splash. Mix it up at Virgin Active and get stronger, fitter, faster. Join now for 12 months and pay nothing in January. T's and C's apply. Run, mix, mix it up, skin. Mix it run. Mix it, mix it. NFL playoffs are here. Make sure you don't miss a minute of this year's postseason action by setting a reminder on TuneIn. Just make sure notifications are allowed on your phone and search for your team on the TuneIn app. Find the game you want to hear and tap Notify Me. We'll send you an alert just in time for kickoff. When you're not listening to your team, take it to the end zone, the rim, or the net. Keep up with the biggest moments in sports by following TuneIn on social media. Block, hook, into the end zone for the touchdown. From reminders of the live top games to tips of the best sports stations and podcasts. Welcome to Undisputed. We are live from Los Angeles. I'm Jenny Taft here with Skip Bayless. Follow and tune in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to get the most out of TuneIn. We can't make traffic move faster during rush hour. But we can help you catch up on the news with TuneIn, with live around-the-clock news from MSNBC. In the U.K., they're significantly worse. When the president gets up to the podium... CNBC and Fox News Talk. The Fox News poll sizing up the race for 2020 found that each of the five top... You can use your stop and go for good by staying in touch with the world. Search news to hear what's happening now. Five, four, three, two, one. Happy New Year. It's a new year and time for you to explore new podcasts on TuneIn. What better way to celebrate the new year than taking a look back at the best podcasts from news and politics to true crime, comedy, and history favorites. We've rounded up our favorites and there's something for everyone. Shows included Dr. Death, Bad Man, My Favorite Murder, Pod Save America. Start your new year with these podcasts and more. Just search podcasts on TuneIn today. Welcome back to the Halftime Report. I'm Seema Modi. We are off the lows of the session, but one relative bright spot today, cybersecurity stocks over concerns of a possible Iranian cyber attack in response to the U.S. airstrike. Now, one of the ETFs that tracks those names, ticker HACK, on pace for its third straight day of gains and sitting less than a percent from record highs. Some of the ETF's most heavily weighted components are outperforming at this hour. CrowdStrike up 3 percent, FireEye up nearly 2 percent, and Fortinet up just just about a percent. One sector, of course, to watch as we await Iran's response. Scott? All right, Seema, thank you. Appreciate it. Target resources under pressure today. Options traders looking for a rebound, though. Looking for that trade, uh, the stock to outperform over the next few weeks. We've sent John to the Telestrator for the uh, unusual activity for a stock. Scott? 
this one back December 19th had unusual activity. Stock was $2 lower than where it is now. You know, Pete and I love to talk about stocks that basically somebody smart bought a big position, cashed out, and then stayed in that same stock. That's what's going on in Targa right now. By the way, Jenny Harrington, hats off to you, Jenny. Uh, she was talking about this one yesterday as well. So Targa, February, 42 calls. They bought these rather aggressively. They're almost 8,000 or 800,000 share equivalent. I bought these calls too. They were trading around $1.20, which I think is a great risk reward. Again, on the risk side, I'll cut that if they fall to 60 cents, Scott, but I'm looking for a lot of upside here, and this could be one of those stocks in the energy space that provides it. Couple quick updates, one that's not so good, Lululemon. Even though I still love the stock, um, 237.50 calls were what they were buying, Scott, um, but they were buying them with an expiration for Lulu today. So even though the stock's up, those options are already dead, and I lost 75 cents on these. I think I paid a buck 50, got out of them around 75 cents, so not so good. Second trade worked out much better. That was Snap, S-N-A-P, we talked about January 19 call, I'm sorry, uh, January 16 calls. Uh, the stock was through 17, almost 17 and a half today. Those calls were 28 cents. They went to a buck 25 today, so nearly a fourfold return on those. And it's always good to exercise your discipline. I am out of these now. Okay. Good stuff. Doc, come on back over because you, we're going to answer some questions next on Costco, Alibaba, and more. And you can still reach us at cnbc.com slash halftime, or you can tweet us. As always, we are back in just two minutes. This isn't just boredom. Fitness enemy number one. So don't just run. Run, run, makes it up, skip, run, skip, run, give yourself a lift, makes, makes it up, lift, makes it up, run, lift, splash, skip, lift, run, it's crunch time, skip, makes, makes it up, run, makes it up, add a boxing class, skip, run, splash, skip, run, mix it up at Virgin Active and get stronger, fitter, faster, join now for 12 months and pay nothing in January, T's and C's apply. Run, mix, mix it up, skip, mix it run, mix it, mix it. Hey, NFL fan, can't watch the game? Can't be there? No biggie. Hot. With your TuneIn Premium membership, you already have an all-access pass to every team and every game in the league. Amazing, right? Steps up, floats it towards at the goal line, it's intercepted! Listen live as the action unfolds, or on demand when you can. Anytime, anywhere, all season long. Towards right side, it is caught, it is in for the right side for the touchdown. Again. Search NFL today. We can't make traffic move faster during rush hour. <laughs> but we can help you catch up on the news with TuneIn, with live around-the-clock news from MSNBC. In the U.K., they're significantly worse. When the president gets up yeah. to the podium... CNBC got... and Fox News Talk. The Fox News poll sizing up the race for 2020 found that each of the five top... You can use your stop and go for good by staying in touch with the world. Search news to hear what's happening now. When you're not listening to your team, take it to the end zone, the rim, or the net. Keep up with the biggest moments in sports by following TuneIn on social media. Uh, block, hook, into the end zone for the touchdown. From reminders of the live top games to tips of the best sports stations and podcasts. Welcome to Undisputed. We are live from Los Angeles. I'm Jenny Taft here with Skip Bayless. Follow and tune in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to get the most out of TuneIn. This is not a commercial. This is a reminder. With TuneIn Premium, you could be listening to more music commercial-free. Get over 45 commercial-free music stations. Visit TuneIn.com slash premium to upgrade. NFL playoffs are here. Make sure you don't miss a minute of this year's postseason action by setting a reminder on TuneIn. Just make sure notifications are allowed on your phone and search for your team on the TuneIn app. Find the game you want to hear and tap Notify Me. We'll send you an alert just in time for kickoff. All right, let's answer some questions now. First up for you, Joe. Tina in Texas. Costco has pulled back from recent highs. Is this a good time to buy more? 
buy more implies that you already own Costco. I would not be buying more. It did not respond after earnings in December. Your next earnings report is going to be on March 5th. The stock peaked out in September. I still want a main exposure to Costco because it would be very hard-pressed to find exposure to consumer staples in a company that has the dividend and growth metrics that this company has. Okay, Doc, here's a really good question, and um, okay. it's about a specific stock, but the lesson, perhaps, or the advice can pertain to anybody with anything. Anthony in Philadelphia, okay? I'm up 25% on Alibaba. I read conflicting info about when to take profits. Should I sell or hold? Now, there are a lot of stocks that are up at least 25% sure. last year. What do you do? I think you could take profits here, Scott. Um, on, on Alibaba. Uh, do you take all of it off? Most of us on the desk, I think, would say I'd scale. In other words, I'd sell 50%. That's my particular discipline. When it gets to a preset level in my head, I take that profit off the table, Scott. Uh, that's what I would do here if he needs to or you know, if it makes more sense for him to take all of it off. I think with the trade negotiations, this one makes a bigger move later in the year. So right now, I think you're getting a pretty good spot to take some profits. Okay, good stuff. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Megan, for you, uh, from Vincent in Birmingham, Alabama, should I invest in some foreign ETFs? I'm pretty sure you're going to say yes, given yeah. your answer at the top of the show. Yeah, we're overweight international um, equities, international developed rather than emerging markets, but I think there's opportunities both there. So you have an improving growth picture. Um, and then the dollar is really important for U.S.-based investors. So when you think about international returns, you should always bring it back into dollar terms. Um, and when we see international growth that might be picking up at a, a more accelerated pace than the U.S., that is usually a recipe for a weaker dollar. Um, which would help your uh, for national returns. Okay, Josh, so just continue on that then. Give me just two ETFs, foreign ETFs, that this person should, that Vincent should take a look at today. I mean, st I guess st start with the whole world. Start with VTI, Vanguard, Total World, and then work, work outward from there is the easiest way to do it. Okay, good stuff. Thank you. And uh, last question goes to you from Michael in Detroit. Is it time to exit the ITB? Time to exit. Yeah, I mean, this was the trade of last year when, when yields came down, mortgage rates came down, and the economy stayed good, so these stocks exploded. Three-year return, 64%. One-year return, 47%. I mean, if you've been in it, you've done very well. Maybe, maybe you can. I don't know your specific situation, but if you had it as a trade, the trade worked. And now it's these stocks have stopped moving up, so why not? Okay, good stuff. Thanks, as always, for the questions. Straight ahead, some of the biggest calls on Wall Street today. We're going to take some positions on Humana, L Brands, and Wingstop. First, though, Dom Chu has a look at what's coming up on the exchange. Domino. All right, some big stuff happening, Scott. Thank you very much. Markets rattled following the U.S. killing of a top Iranian general, but they're bouncing back right now. We have the very latest in what could happen next. Plus... Could geopolitical tensions change the Fed's interest rate decision process? Dallas Fed President Robert Kaplan joins us. He's a voting member this year. And as the U.S. braces for retaliation from Iran, how likely is a cyber attack and what could be the primary target? That's all ahead on The Exchange. The Halftime Report is back right after this. Whether you've enjoyed the legendary terrain in Telluride, boredom, Fitness enemy number one. So don't just run, run, run. Mix it up, skip, run, skip, run. Give yourself a lift, mix, mix it up, lift, mix it up, run, lift, splash, skip, lift, run. It's crunch time, skip, mix, mix it up, run, mix it up. Add a boxing class, skip, run, splash, skip, run. Mix it up at Virgin Active and get stronger, fitter, faster. Join now for 12 months and pay nothing in January. T's and C's apply. Run, mix, mix it, run, skin, mix it, run, mix it, mix it. You don't just live in one room, so why should you Wi-Fi? With Sky Broadband's Wi-Fi guarantee, you'll get Wi-Fi in every room or money back. Perfect for food shopping in the bedroom, gaming in your PJs in the lounge, or streaming sci-fi movies in the kitchen. Get Sky's super fast broadband and Wi-Fi guarantee. £32 a month for 18 months with 1995 setup. Click on the banner now. Sky Fiber Areas, Sky Kit Required. Refund on boost component of subscription pay during current minimum term up to date of claim. Minimum 3 megabits per second or money back. Prices may change during minimum term. See sky.com slash guarantee. You might already know that TuneIn allows you to listen to all the pro sports leagues wherever you go. But did you know TuneIn is also home to the wide world of college sports? Open 3, DeAndre Hunter got it! 
Hand off Carruthers. Big hole right side. He leaps and he surges in. Touchdown. From live college football, basketball, and baseball games to podcasts and coaches shows fueling your love for the game and your school. And the best part is it's all free. Search college sports to find your team or league. Ah, finally another commercial, said no one ever. Visit TuneIn.com slash premium to upgrade now and get over 45 commercial-free music stations. We can't make traffic move faster during rush hour. (laughs) But we can help you catch up on the news with TuneIn with live around-the-clock news from MSNBC. In the U.K., they're significantly worse. When the president gets up to the podium... CNBC and Fox News Talk. The Fox News poll sizing up the race for 2020 found that each of the five top... You can use your stop-and-go for good by staying in touch with the world. Search news to hear what's happening now. Don't want to miss a second of the NFL playoffs? Set reminders with TuneIn to stay in sync with the postseason. Just make sure notifications are allowed on your phone and search for your team on the TuneIn app. Find the game you want to hear and tap Notify Me. We'll let you know exactly when live coverage begins. Welcome back. I have some analyst calls that we're following today. I just want to hit some more stocks with you guys. Uh, Humana, Doc, added to the conviction buy list at Goldman Sachs, one that Kramer highlighted this morning on Squawk on the Street. Reiterate buy. 425 bucks the price target for Humana. You'd be hard-pressed to find somebody in the healthcare space that's better at virtually everything they do than this one. So I'm not surprised to see them added, Scott. Um, I, I know that this is a favorite of my brother's as well, and I see no reason to disagree with Goldman on the call. Okay. Um, Joe, yes. yesterday you picked Wingstop I did. as your final trade. I did. Final trade, right? Upgraded today to outperform from neutral at Wedbush. Maybe they were watching. Uh, price target goes to 105 from 88. Mm-hmm. I will, by the way, buy this and put it in the portfolio. Goldman Sachs conviction buy list. You're talking about 10. percent Wait a minute. Same. You recommended it yesterday and you didn't buy it yourself. I did not buy it yesterday. Now you waited um, for an 8 percent move. I, I will buy it. I'll, I'll get it in I'm there. Teach you how to go shopping. Okay. okay. You actually <laughs> shop before the 8 percent. You did a good job with Jimmy Labor. I was going to say Apple with Labor. So okay. Yeah. You did a good job with that one. So <laughs> we'll, talk, we'll talk after. We'll this talk show, after I, the show. I got you. Don't worry. 10 uh, percent same store sale grower. Tremendous opportunity. You're talking about fresh cooked chicken. Um, Josh, just sit there frozen. Um, but a tremendous opportunity to gain market share from the pizza market. Okay. Um, to expand here domestically. This is a company that really can expand itself and has flexibility on the balance sheet to do so. Okay. And lastly, Josh, to you, you hated on L Brands yesterday. L Brands upgraded today to a buy at Bank of America. That's the one with the 8%. Dude, Wingstop was 3.5%. Are you kidding me? No, oh, doing this right now. Dude, this L stock, Brands this stock upgraded. Was, this stock was 70. Okay. I don't I know, I just brought it up. I, don't, I made it got upgraded. Buy, I, don't, I wanted to bring I don't it up. Hate you, on it. You I hated think, on it yesterday. I think what I was trying to say was that the company is very out of favor with its core consumer. We're in a woke culture. Yeah. And 100 pound women walking the runway is like not what's in vogue right now. Uh, the brand is struggling. I, it may not be forever. They also have the taint of the Epstein stuff, which I really don't want to get into with seven minutes left in the show. Big dividend uh, yield. It's an ugly situation. So I, listen, I hope it works out. I don't hate it. I don't, I don't, hate, I don't hate any stock. I don't hate any stock, like Nancy Pelosi said. I don't hate anyone. I pray for L Brands. I, pray, I still I pray for L Brands. I hope things go well and they turn the company around. Okay. Well, Doc, you own it. Own I own calls. it. You own I'm calls. happy about it. Um, I think that it goes through 20. I think some of the recent targets, Scott, were up around 22 by some of the brokerages that have upgraded in addition to this one. I think it gets there, and I think it gets there in the next month. Are you, buy- are you buying it? I'm along it already. You think they're going to pay that 6.35% yield over the next year? I do. I, I do. don't. You do hate Altria, by the way. Yeah, I actually. But I appreciate you praying for it. I don't think. I don't think. I don't think they'll keep a six percent dividend. I think they need to reinvest into whatever the future of the company is going to be. I think it would be a mistake to keep that yield. But that's a I big, that's a we'll big say, dividend. It it's, is. It's absurd. There is no. There is no retailer in America that should be paying out that percentage. Uh, and I don't know what percentage that is of their after-tax income. Should not be doing it. Should be reinvesting in the future of the company. It's a huge mistake. I hope they caught it. Okay. We'll do final trade. Straight ahead. Boredom. 
fitness enemy number one. So don't just run, run, run. Mix it up, skip, run, skip, run. Give yourself a lift, mix, mix it up, lift, mix it up, run, lift, splash, skip, lift, run. It's crunch time. Skip, mix, mix it up, run, mix it up. Add a boxing class. Skip, run, splash, skip, run. Mix it up at Virgin Active and get stronger, fitter, faster. Join now for 12 months and pay nothing in January. T's and C's apply. Run, mix, mix it up, skip, mix it run. Fans, the 2019-20 NHL season is here. It takes it home! And with this team, it's it's really fun to be a part of a team like that. And you can hear the action live on TuneIn Premium. From regular season action to the All-Star Game and through the Stanley Cup in June. Hear the home and away call for every game, for every team live. At home or on the go, never miss a game with the NHL on TuneIn Premium. Upgrade today. We can't make traffic move faster during rush hour. But we can help you catch up on the news with TuneIn. With live around-the-clock news from MSNBC. In the UK, they're significantly worse. When the president gets up yeah. to the podium... CNBC got- and Fox News Talk. The Fox News poll sizing up the race for 2020 found that each of the five top... Demo- you can use your stop and go for good by staying in touch with the world. Search news to hear what's happening now. Hey, NFL fan, can't watch the game? Can't be there? No biggie. With your TuneIn Premium membership, you already have an all-access pass to every team and every game in the league. Amazing, right? Steps up, floats it towards... At the goal line, it's intercepted! Listen live as the action unfolds, or on demand when you can. Anytime, anywhere, all season long. right side, it is caught. It is in for the right side for the touchdown. Search NFL today. This is not a commercial. This is a reminder. With TuneIn Premium, you could be listening to more music commercial-free. Get over 45 commercial-free music stations. Visit TuneIn.com slash premium to upgrade. I love the new My WW program because it's... Be better informed, be better prepared. The Better Network is on tune in. This is Brent Musburger. Search B-E-T-R and start hanging out with me and my guys in the desert weekday afternoons. The Better Network is now on tune in. NFL playoffs are here. Make sure you don't miss a minute of this year's postseason action by setting a reminder on TuneIn. Just make sure notifications are allowed on your phone and search for your team on the TuneIn app. Find the game you want to hear and tap Notify Me. We'll send you an alert just in time for kickoff. Hello, I'm Nat Coombs from ESPN's The Nat Coombs Show, which admittedly is 1 out of 10 for original podcast name, but 10 out of 10 for NFL chat. Every week, we're dropping four episodes with an all-pro lineup of terrific guests, journalists, comedians, players, coaches, you name it, all getting you up to speed with everything gridiron. The Nat Coombs Show, American football, British accent. Add to your favorites and listen on TuneIn. In case you didn't know, TuneIn lets you listen to the same radio stations you pick up on your home or car radio, except you can hear them from anywhere. If you want to find a station from somewhere else in the world, navigate to the By Location section under Browse. Keep exploring with TuneIn. Pascal gobbles up the rebound and slams it down. Get your favorite NBA team right here on TuneIn. A step back, D3 is up and in. Search NBA on TuneIn and hear all the action. The NBA lives on TuneIn. Want to hear about the latest and greatest things to listen to on TuneIn? For reminders of the biggest live sports games, debates, and breaking news stories, follow at TuneIn on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to stay connected with the audio that matters to you. Safe and won't scratch and talk about non-stick. This salmon cooks skin side down with no added butter or oil, just doesn't stick. This steak is perfectly seared, just like the pros. And because Granite Stone is oven rated to 500 degrees, we bake this upside down pan pizza to perfection and it just doesn't stick. Fire Flambe Delicious Cherries Jubilee. Plus it's PFOA free and 100% dishwasher safe. Call or go online to get your Granite Stone pan for the special TV discount price of just $19.99. 
Granite Stone is so durable it comes with a 10-year warranty. And with every order, you're going to get a Granite Stone single-serve egg pan absolutely free. It's the perfect size for personalized eggs, omelets, or frittatas that slide right out. It makes the best bacon, egg, and cheese sandwich quick. Yours absolutely free. We'll even ship your entire order free. That's right, free shipping. You get it all at incredible value. Here's how to order. To order, call 1-800-652-6184. That's 1-800-652-6184 or order online at buygranitestone.com. That's 1-800-652-6184. Call now. Grubhub, America's leader in food delivery, just got better. Introducing Perks, millions of dollars in deals and free food nationwide. Download the Grubhub app today and get free delivery on your first order. All right, quickly, final trades. Josh Brown, Store Capital, Megan Chu. Industrials. John Nigerian. KKR. Okay, and Joey. Domino's Pizza. Also not me. It was Joe. <laughs> Good weekend, everybody. <laughs> All of you as well. Stocks are off their lows right now. The exchange begins now. <laughs> Thanks very much, Scott. Welcome to The Exchange. I'm Dominic Chu. A developing story as the United States kills a top Iranian general in an airstrike. What happens next and what could the retaliation be? Plus, markets rattled by the news overseas, but off their lows of the session, should you be making moves in your portfolio or just stay the course? And an exclusive interview, Dallas Fed President Robert Kaplan on the Fed's next moves. He's a big one there. He's a voting member on the Fed this year. But let's now get right to our top story. All right. The U.S. killing Iran's top commander, General Qasem Soleimani, in an airstrike in Baghdad. Soleimani has been a key figure in Middle East politics and Iranian politics for some time, and some have considered him the country's most powerful military commander. His death exacerbating what's already been high tensions between the Iran and the United States here. The Department of Defense saying that General Soleimani was actively developing plans to attack American service members and diplomats throughout the region. In response, the Iranian foreign minister called the strike an act of terrorism and, quote, an extremely dangerous and a foolish escalation. Stocks and the oil markets reacting to the news with oil shooting higher and stocks moving to the downside, but again, off their lows of the day. For more on those moves today, let's bring in Bob Pisani at the New York Stock Exchange, also Seema Modi here at CNBC headquarters. Bob, we'll start with you. It's been a whipsaw day. It has, and the low print was right at the open, and I mean right at 9.30. Let's just take a look at the major indexes. We were down as much as 368 points on the Dow Industrials, if you'll notice. We have cut that more than in half. Same with the S&P 500, also with the NASDAQ. If you look at Dow movers, yes, we saw the big cyclical names, big uh, Briem, Caterpillar, for example, weak at the open. They are off of the lows. And what happened to that oil rally? Some of the big global oil names are now negative on the day, like Exxon Mobil. Defense stocks have held up and throughout the day near the highs. Lockheed Martin, historic highs. Raytheon, historic highs as well. Been a great year for them, even in 2019. Airlines are down, but not as much as you might think. They, too, are off of their lows. That's something I point out all the time. Cost for oil and uh, for these airlines is much, much lower than it used to be. Used to be 20, 25 percent. Fuel costs now maybe 10 or 15 percent. Labor is the most expensive part of running an airline, along with a number of other expenses like parts and labor, air Port fees, etc. Dom, back to you. All right, Bob Pisani, thank you very much for that run on the markets. Oil jumping sharply following news of that U.S. airstrike that killed Iran's top military commander in Baghdad, Iraq. You can see the spike right there in the 8 p.m. hour last night when that news broke. Right now, oil is up more than 2%. It's off the highs of the session. Seema Modi joins me now with more on the repercussions on the energy sector. And Seema, it's been interesting because these moves have now tempered a bit as the hours have carried on. Yeah, that's exactly right. Worldwide exchange, oil prices are up over 4%, which would have been the highest level since September when that Saudi attack took place. But now the world awaits Iran's next move. As you were pointing out, Qasem Soleimani, uh, a key architect in military operations in the country, widely seen as one of the the most powerful military leaders. And foreign policy analysts say it's this type of context that is important to understand when trying to gauge or measure the type of response we could see from 
Iran. Now, the energy market is most concerned about the Strait of Hormuz, Iran possibly taking aim at this critical passageway, uh, average 21 million barrels of oil flows through this channel every day, and Iran in the past has taken aim at this channel. So that, of course, is something that the energy market is watching very closely. Another possible plan, a lot of foreign policy analysts are saying this morning, is uh, Iran's role in Iraq. Worth noting, Iraq is the fifth largest producer of oil already, and it has a couple of key bases, uh, specifically in the south at Basra. Eurasia analysts saying this morning that if the Iranians attack Iraq's production of oil in the southern tip, that that could result in oil prices shooting up to $80 a barrel, Dom. All right, so just to kind of follow up on this, we talk about the possible retaliation points here. Is it that the markets right now seem to be waiting for what that next step could be, and that's why the moves are so tempered the way that they are right now? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is one of the most consequential assassinations in Middle East history, in recent years at least. So now the question is, how does Iran respond and retaliate, either look to the Strait of Hormuz or uh, Iraq's oil production? But uh, others saying that there are certainly other ways that they can retaliate, whether it's the Hezbollah in Israel, Syria, tensions in Afghanistan. So a lot is on the plate here. We're going to be diving into much more of that throughout the course of this hour with a lot of experts. Seema Modi, thank you very much for that. Appreciate it. Well, the president responding to the killing of General Soleimani on Twitter. Eamon Javers is live in Washington, D.C. with the very latest at this hour. Eamon. Yeah, that's right, Dom. A couple of developments here in Washington to bring you up to speed on. The Pentagon saying now that elements of the 82nd Airborne are going to be going to the region. About a brigade's worth of troops now uh, will be sent in. About 3,500 more troops uh, sent into the Middle East. Also here in Washington in the Senate, uh, Mitch McConnell taking to the Senate floor to support the president's actions uh, against this Iranian general in Baghdad and also saying that the administration is arranging a classified briefing for all senators early next week, not today necessarily, but early next week, and all senators will have access to that information at that point. Meanwhile, the president, as you point out, taking to Twitter today to, uh, with a pair of arguments, a couple of paired tweets, the first one directed at the people of Iraq, the president making the case really uh, in the first set of tweets that the people of Iraq don't want to be dominated by Iran, and therefore they should support the action that he's taken of taking out a key Iranian general who was in Baghdad, uh, clearly operating in Baghdad, although we don't know exactly what he was working on at the time of the strike last night. And also, in another pair of tweets, the president uh, making the case that the Iranian people themselves uh, don't love Qassam Soleimani as much as their leadership might like people to believe today. The president suggesting on Twitter that he believes anyway that the Iranian people themselves uh, might be a little bit more relieved uh, about this attack uh, than the leadership of Iran is letting on. So the president sort of giving a sense of how he wants people in the region to perceive what happened last night. And we'll see whether we get any response from the Iranian side today or any additional statements from the president. We will see him later on this afternoon in Florida at a pre-scheduled event, Tom. All right. Thanks to Eamon Javers for that current state of play out in Washington, D.C. So how will developments impact U.S. relations in the Middle East? Joining us now on the phone, retired Army Colonel Jack Jacobs. And joining us from Washington, D.C., Carl Skupchin, Senior Fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. Perhaps, Colonel, we will start with you first as we talk about this situation developing. How critical is it and how important is it for the U.S. to get this situation resolved? Is Iran that big of a threat? Well, Iran has always been a big threat, not just to us, but to everybody else in the Middle East. Suleimani has been operating, well, more or less with impunity for decades. And the countries in the Middle East uh, are not particularly enthralled with the idea of Iran projecting its influence as it has been since the United States uh, has decided to leave the area. Uh, they're not happy with that. Having said that, what everybody in the region is most concerned about is a lack of stability. Stability is not something that one finds in the Middle East very often, and now it's even more unstable. Um, the, the situation, if it does escalate, is not going to escalate any place except in the Middle East, and this concerns everybody there. So when you use the military instrument of power, as we have, even in one incident like this, it's very important to coordinate it with the other instruments of power. Uh, we don't do that very well. 
Uh, we've used economic instruments. They haven't worked very well. We don't have very much patience, as it turns out, but they haven't worked very well. We've used diplomatic instruments. They haven't worked very well. What we haven't done is to coordinate all of that. And to do that, we need a strategy. Uh, yeah, I don't think anybody is convinced that the administration actually has a mid to long term strategy for how things are supposed to go in the Middle East and how we're supposed to operate in it. So, so Colonel, so that, that, that brings up an excellent point. I want to turn now to Charles because I want to talk about the strategy. The Colonel seems to think that there may not be one in place, but what should, Charles, the strategy be, given what we've already seen, given that the strike has already happened, what are the next steps, and how can we kind of put that decision tree in play and in process? What are the next steps here? Well, I think the Colonel's right. It doesn't look like the Trump administration had a clear strategy. I think the, the best sign of that is that the escalation went from zero to 60 overnight. Right. What we probably would have preferred to see is a graduated escalation, not going for someone with the notoriety, with uh, the power of, of Soleimani. And now, in some ways, the Iranians are going to be forced to retaliate. I'm less concerned about war between Iran and the United States because I don't think that either the Trump administration or the Iranian regime wants that. But I do think that in Iraq, where we have thousands of troops, in other countries in the region, the Iranians can do us a lot of harm. The Iranians have a lot of influence in, uh, in Iraq. So I think the next step is to try to open a corridor of communication to the Iranians and to prevent this from a tit-for-tat escalation in which we are hurtling forward and, and, and get a war that at this point I don't think either side wants. And the Colonel's right. We need to marry our diplomatic engagement with uh, Iran, with our economic sanctions, with our military pressure. Right now, those three prongs of strategy are not integrated. So, so, so an interesting point being brought up here, you have to figure the State Department is looking to try to de-escalate things as we stand. Colonel, I'll turn back to you. We, we know that there are a number of U.S. assets in the Gulf region, just as Charles has pointed out. In a hypothetical scenario where we do have some kind of planned retaliation from Iran, what exactly could we expect to see in terms of targets, possible targets, that Iran would look to go after as a proportional response to what happened with Soleimani? Well, one has to start with the assumption that Charles brought up and that nobody actually wants a war in the Middle East between the United States and, uh, and Iran, not the least of whom is Iran, because they would, uh, if things would turn out very badly for them. So if you start with that assumption, you can expect to see uh, small uh, attacks, relatively small attacks of the type we've already seen, and not directly by Iran, but instead by Iran's uh, 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 proxies. Uh, attacks on shipping, perhaps, uh, Hezbollah attacking areas. Uh, we've seen rockets go into forward operating bases, uh, American allied forward operating bases. You're probably going to see more of that. Um, what you're probably not going to see um, are, is a large-scale attack of some kind on an American installation that's unlikely to happen uh, precisely because they don't – I think Iran does not necessarily want to be associated directly with the kind of, uh, the kind of response that would engender a massive American counterattack. Sure. I don't think they want that. Gotcha. All right, Charles, just a few moments left here. The last word to you. What is the likelihood the U.S. gets drawn into a full-scale assault and war conventionally with Iran? I think it's pretty low likelihood. I don't think the president wants that. He promised his base that we're going to be pulling out of the Middle East, not getting in deeper. And so I think he's going to instruct the people around him to try to turn down the heat, not turn up the heat. But this was a, a move that has a certain reckless quality to it. Things can unfold in ways that the president doesn't want. So I do think these next few days are critical. I agree with uh, the colonel. The Iranians are likely to continue to go after relatively low-level assets. The United States should try to keep the lid on this because, as I said, things could rapidly spin out of control if the U.S. and Iran start turning up the heat in a tit-for-tat way. 
All right, Colonel Jack Jacobs, thank you very much. Also, Carl Chepton at the, at the Council on Foreign Relations, thank you very much for those thoughts on the developing situation in Iran. Meanwhile, the Middle East turmoil is dragging down the markets, but not as much as you would think. We started the day down nearly 400 points in the Dow, but now we're down just half a percent. If an escalation like this can't shake the markets, can anything shake the markets at this point? For more on this, let's bring in Craig Columbus, CEO of Columbus Macro, also Chris Zaccarelli, Chief Investment Officer for the Independent Advisor Alliance. And perhaps we'll say, Craig, and start with you, this was so interesting to me because even when I saw the headlines and I saw the market reaction, I thought to myself initially, why isn't the market down more? Why isn't the market down more? Some of it, I think people expected a, a more volatile geopolitical year because of these sanctions in Iran are really starting to take a bite on the regime and they are sort of acting out. This was a preemptive move. But some of, I think the conditions that are still in place, right, we don't have the same like we had last year in the sense that first half of election years tend to be volatile and we're not going to have the Fed switching on a dime from quantitative tightening to quantitative easing, but still slow and steady economy. Fed is buying short dated treasuries. Wages are growing faster than inflation. And you still have the China trade deal. By doing it in phases, you have a phase one deal, which was pretty modest, but the fact that nobody can get too bearish because by doing it in phases, you can still roll out good news in the future. So the conditions that pushed us higher last year are still in place today. All right. So, Chris, does this kind of give you some comfort then, this idea now that markets aren't and investors and traders aren't reacting you know, violently one way or the other, given this news? And, and is this, in your mind, a change in market regime or just more noise that investors should kind of gloss over because the fundamentals in the U.S. and globally are still somewhat intact? Well, I would say it's probably the latter. Uh, you know, if you really look at the re uh, regime change, that change happened last year when the Fed went from tightening to easing. And so we're still in an easy money regime. The economy is still doing well. We are seeing it move along at a pretty good pace. You're seeing consumer confidence is high and spending has followed that. So really, everything is in place for the market to keep moving higher. However, you do have those geopolitical risks. And what happened last night is just one example of that. So whether it's Iran, whether it's North Korea, there's always going to be risks to the market. And if things were to spiral out of control and really ratchet up higher, as the former guests were saying, then you may want to reassess. But in, in light of everything that we've seen so far, based on this action and, and some possible uh, Iran uh, counter reactions, for the most part, really the underpinnings are still positive. And I think that's why the market is being pretty resilient to what would otherwise be a, a somewhat uh, so, uh, upsetting and surprising move uh, in, in other market regimes. Right, Chris, just to follow up on that, w then where would you be looking to invest? Is the energy complex still attractive? Is it technology, which has been a leadership group for a while now? So where, where exactly do you go and where do you stay away from? Well, I think if you if you look at what's just happened recently, the knee-jerk reaction is to move into energy. I would actually caution the opposite, and I would really say you want to look at what's going to be what's been working and what's likely to continue working throughout the year in the absence of some really big change. So I do believe if you look at technology, where you've got semiconductors that have been doing well up until recently but have a lot of legs behind them, you look at within industrials, there's the industrial conglomerates, as well as looking within financials. I think those larger banks, those larger investment banks, should be resilient. Today's a day where all of those uh, sectors have been down, and it could be an opportunity to really position yourself for the rest of the year. I wouldn't let you last night's events dictate what you do for all of 2020. I, I think for now, this is a short-term story. Craig, quick last word to you. Is this a situation where the U.S. is still the most attractive market in the world? Well, I actually think the greater opportunity lies outside the U.S. Uh, look at China, where the regime is going to be celebrating 2021. It's going to be celebrating the 100th anniversary of the party. You saw the triple R cut. The, outside the U.S., in the emerging world, the uh, central banks have been more aggressive. And I think you actually see a catch-up trade in emerging, or you, even in Europe, relative to the U.S., who I think will be better performing markets this year. All right. Craig Columbus, Chris Zaccarelli, thank you guys very much for those thoughts on the market, given this around situation. Appreciate it. Well, the next Fed meeting is scheduled for the end of this month, and the question is whether or not rising geopolitical tensions could become a factor in the Fed's decision-making process on interest rates. For that, let's go live to San Diego, California, where Steve Leisman is sitting by and standing by with Dallas Fed President Robert Kaplan. Steve, over to you. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, President Kaplan, thanks for joining us today. Pleasure to be here, Steve. Uh, interesting day for you to be here. One of your specialties, one of the areas of uh, expertise at the Dallas Fed is our oil prices. Yeah. What do you make of the muted reaction or the reaction uh, to the oil market to what's happened uh, with Iran and in Iraq? Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's notable 
it, I think you would have gotten a different reaction 10 years ago, certainly 20 years ago, and I think it's indicative of the United States now producing 12 million barrels a day where we rival Russia and Saudi Arabia in ter terms of energy production. We're much more energy self-sufficient. So uh, because of that, you'll see these events in the Middle East. They'll have an effect, but it's going to be more muted than we might have seen historically. What kind of reaction do you need to see in the oil market to get some kind of reaction in overall economic growth in the United States? How would it? How will it negative? How, how could it? How big a reaction? Yeah, in other so, words, a couple bucks isn't yeah, going to move no, the and, GDP needle. And it's interesting. Again, this is different than ten or twenty years ago. We've done a lot of work on this. Ten or twenty years ago, if oil prices went up. It hurt the consumer. We were a net importer, so it was negative net net negative for GDP. We, now, because we produce so much of our own oil. Uh, it helps producers. It still hurts consumers. We're also a more energy efficient economy. We're less energy sensitive. And so we think the, the effect, even if you had a 5 or $10 up, uh, is going to be more balanced. It's not going to be material uh, uh, in the way it might have been historically. And it's a little bit more uncertain whether it's actually positive or negative. It's more balanced. Beyond the impact on oil, there's just an uncertainty factor that comes along with what's going on yeah. in the Middle East right now. How does that fold in to your economic outlook along with the other uncertainties that are out there? So we know global growth going into this year has been weak. We know manufacturing has been weak. And we know trade uncertainty has been an issue. And business fixed investment, we think mainly due to uncertainty, has been sluggish. So to the extent you've got global uncertainty, we still think it weighs somewhat on business fixed investment and manufacturing. But, it, but still, because the consumer is strong and we still expect some stabilization, we still think we can grow to two and a quarter percent in 2020. Is it your expectation that consumer remains strong through 2020? Yeah, it is still. And uh, I think you'd have to see more severe weakness in global growth, manufacturing, business fixed investment, weaker than what we've seen and what we expect uh, to spread to other parts of the economy. I don't see that. I think we will have a year of solid growth. Let's leap from that to your views on the overall outlook for 2020, along with what you think policy ought to do. Well, on the Fed funds rate, as you and I have discussed, I don't think we should be making any moves at this point on the uh, Fed funds rate. Uh, well, obviously, we could keep revisiting that as the year goes on. For me, the issue will be now that we've gotten through year end in terms of the repo market, I'm sure we'll have some significant debates in the early part of this year about the size and trajectory of the Fed balance sheet. Let's follow, let me follow up on that. September, you began to, uh, your reverse course, you had been cutting, this, reducing the size of the balance sheet, yeah. then you started growing it. Yeah. Should you continue to grow it the way it's been growing along with uh, the economy, or is it time to reduce the balance sheet? So there's been two parts to the growth. One is buying $60 billion, a mil bill, 60 billion of Treasury bills a month. And we've said we'll do that until the spring. The second part of the balance sheet growth has been these daily and term repo operations. Those uh, will hopefully run off. Uh, and the debate I'm suggesting we need to have is as we wind up these planned $60 billion a month of Treasury purchases, what do we do next? And what do I mean by that? Uh, should we have a standing repo facility, which might, in fact, let us slow down or curtail the Treasury bill purchases. What's your take on that? Uh, I think we need to debate it. I haven't come to a okay. conclusion, but but I I, I want to, my objective uh, for policy should be that we, we have the smallest possible balance sheet in an ample reserves regime, which means I'm sensitive to growth in the balance sheet. I think we needed to do this in light of the repo volatility, and we've done the right thing heading through year end. But now that we've gotten past year end, I want to find ways to grow the balance sheet more slowly. That would be my objective. I'm sure there'll be disagreement about that, but that's what I'd be advocating. I just want to do one more question here. You're going to be a voter this year. Um, you can't stay on hold forever. You're going to go one way or the other. If you had to guess now, which direction would be the next move? Too, too early to guess. Uh, on the one hand, I told you I expect uh, solid growth this year, two, two and a quarter percent. On the other hand, we've got still trade uncertainty. We've got uh, weak manufacturing, as we saw today. And so I think it's just too soon for me to say, and I'll, I'll have a more refined answer to that question maybe as we get two or three months into the year. But at the moment, I'd, I'd stay agnostic. What about inflation? Some of your colleagues are more worked up about the issue of not hitting your inflation target. Do you think it's something that 
ought to prompt the Fed to act if you continue this year to not make your 2% target? I am also, as you say, worked up about not hitting our inflation target, but uh, there are other factors that I also want to consider. And, uh, and so I'd be, I'd be uh, supportive of maybe a longer averaging period or other things we can do to make it uh, uh, more oomph to meeting our target. Having said that, I'm also worried about excesses and imbalances building in the economy. And so, and I also think it's critical that Fed policy is forward looking, not backward looking. So even if we extend the averaging period, which I'm supportive of, that's an analytic. It doesn't mean when we get to making decisions that I won't want to take into account other factors that are forward looking uh, but I would be willing to let inflation run for a time above our 2% target. I'd be supportive of that. But it's subject to what's going on with other factors, including financial stability and excesses and imbalances. Robert Kaplan, Dallas Fed President, thanks for joining us. Good to see you, Steve. All right, back to you guys. All right, thanks very much, our own Steve Leisman, and of course, Dallas Fed President Robert Kaplan as well. We appreciate it. Well, coming up on the show, L Brands getting a lot of love from Wall Street today. What's changed for that battered retailer? That's coming up ahead. Plus, as the U.S. braces for retaliation from Iran, a look at how real a cyber threat is and what institutions and infrastructure could become primary targets. Don't go anywhere. The exchange is back in just two minutes. Deeper data at CNBC. The Restaurant Performance Index rose to an eight-month high in November. The rise was driven by higher same-store sales and growing customer traffic levels. You know that tech stock we talked about? Boredom. Fitness enemy number one. So don't just run. 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 Mix it up. Skip. Run. Skip. Run. Give yourself a lift. Mix, mix it up. Lift. Mix it up. Run. Lift. Splash. Skip. Lift. Run. It's crunch time. Skip. Mix, mix it up. Run. Mix it up. Add a boxing class. Skip. Run. Splash. Skip. Run. Mix it up at Virgin Active and get stronger, fitter, faster. Join now for 12 months and pay nothing in January. T's and C's apply. Run. Mix, mix it up. Skip. Want tune in to remind you when the big NFL game is about to get underway? Be sure notifications are allowed on your phone and search NFL on the TuneIn app. Find the game you want to hear under events and tap notify me. We'll let you know exactly when it's time to listen in for kickoff. When you're not listening to your team, take it to the end zone, the rim, or the net. Keep up with the biggest moments in sports by following TuneIn on social media. Touchdown! From reminders of the live top games to tips of the best sports stations and podcasts. Welcome to Undisputed. We are live from Los Angeles. I'm Jenny Taft here with Skip Bayless. Follow and tune in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to get the most out of TuneIn. Welcome back to the exchange markets. Right now, as you can see there, the Dow off by just about 162 points, the S&P off by about 13, and the Nasdaq down by about 38 points. By the way, right near session highs for the day so far, so a far cry from where we were just after the opening bell. Let's check out some of the movers this hour. Shares of General Motors down more than 2% following disappointing sales in the fourth quarter, with trucks and SUVs seeing the biggest declines in part due to a 40-day worker strike that happened this past year. But a different story for Tesla, with deliveries coming in ahead of consensus at a record 112,000 in the fourth quarter. That brings the total to 367,000 in change for all of 2019, which is in line with guidance from the company. That stock is up more than 3% as a result. Now let's send it over to Sue Herrera, who's got a CNBC News update. Sue. Indeed I do, Dom. Thanks very much. Here's what's happening at this hour, everyone. China's ambassador to the United Nations says his country is opposed to the use of force in international relations. He made the comments at the United Nations after a reporter asked if the U.S. strike which killed Iran's top general was a violation of the U.N. Charter. We are... Uh paying close attention to the situation and uh, against any use of, form in, uh, of force in international uh, relations and the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Iraq should be uh, fully uh, respected. 
A man armed with a knife rampaged through a Paris park, attacking passersby seemingly at random. He killed one person and injured two others before police shot him dead. The man's motives were not immediately clear. And here at home, according to the latest data from the CDC, 37 states are now reporting high flu activity. That's an increase from 28 states the week before. Over 6 million people have come down with the flu so far this season, and 55,000 had to be hospitalized. Nearly 3,000 people have died. You are up to date. That's the news update at this hour. Dom, back to you. All right, Sue Herrera, thank you very much for that. Here is what else is coming up on The Exchange. Ahead, the love for Apple continues and continues. An unloved retailer gets a big confidence boost from Wall Street. And falling prices, rising inventory, and big discounts. Not the words you want to hear about your city's real estate. It's all coming up on The Exchange. We set out to make the... This is not a cat. This is not a rocket. And this is not a sale. That's right. At Smarty Mobile, we're not having a sale. While others are slashing prices, we're introducing our best ever new plans. Take our new 30 gig data SIM for just £10 a month. With unlimited calls and texts and no speed restrictions, credit checks or contract tying you down, why shop around? New plans, great value. Now that's Smarty. Grab yours today. Search Smarty Mobile. See smarty.co.uk for terms. Five, four, three, two, one. Happy New Year. It's a new year and time for you to explore new podcasts on TuneIn. Exciting new podcasts like How I Built This from NPR. A show about innovators, entrepreneurs, idealists, stories behind the movements. Go. The Rachel Maddow Show from MSNBC. Good evening. Thanks for being with us. Happy holidays. Congressman What's next David? from Slate? Start your new year with these podcasts and more. Just search podcasts on TuneIn today. To LeBron, slam dunk. The NBA is on TuneIn Premium. Each week, TuneIn picks an NBA game you just can't miss. Hard pulls back, trying to make it 11 to 2. The Pelicans are taking on the Lakers in Los Angeles for the first time since the big offseason trade, sending Anthony Davis to L.A. Today, the Pelicans are at the Lakers. Tip-off is at 10.30 p.m. Eastern. Search NBA on TuneIn to follow your favorite NBA team today. We can't make traffic move faster during rush hour. <laughs> but we can help you catch up on the news with TuneIn. With live around-the-clock news from MSNBC. In the UK, they're significantly worse. When the president gets up yeah. to the podium... CNBC got- and Fox News Talk. The Fox News poll sizing up the race for 2020 found that each of the five top... Dem- you can use your stop and go for good by staying in touch with the world. Search news to hear what's happening now. Don't want to miss a second of the NFL playoffs? Set reminders with TuneIn to stay in sync with the postseason. Just make sure notifications are allowed on your phone and search for your team on the TuneIn app. Find the game you want to hear and tap Notify Me. We'll let you know exactly when live coverage begins. This is not a commercial. This is a reminder. With TuneIn Premium, you could be listening to more music commercial-free. Get over 45 commercial-free music stations. Visit TuneIn.com slash premium to upgrade. Fans, the 2019-20 NHL season is here. It takes it home! And with this team, it's it's really fun to be a part of a team like that. You can hear the action live on TuneIn Premium. From regular season action to the All-Star Game and through the Stanley Cup in June. Hear the home and away call for every game for every team live. At home or on the go, never miss a game with the NHL on TuneIn Premium. Upgrade today. All right, folks, let's catch you up on a few stories that need to be on your radar. It's time for Rapid Fire on this Friday. Here with their takes, we got Kate Rogers, also Robert Frank, and Courtney Reagan as well. This all-star lineup is going to be weighing in first on Apple, kicking off 2020 with two big price target hikes. But let's look at where the stock was just one year ago, because it was this day, this day, one year ago, January 3rd, 2019, the stock fell to 142 bucks a share, having its worst day in six years. Fast forward to yesterday when shares closed above $300 a piece for a total return 
of 112% over that one year span. Now, Bank of America and RBC Capital boosting their targets to 330 bucks a share a piece. Apple, the juggernaut, it was given up for maybe dead, not really, but Courtney, this is a big deal in a time when the American consumer continues to not just buy iPhones, but just about everything else Apple has and to And remember sell. when we were so scared that Apple was really going to get caught in the crosshairs of this trade war, and they have managed it well, whether it's Tim Cook's management uh, with the White House, the supply chain, a combination of the two things. The stock run is pretty unbelievable, and it feels like you can't have a rally unless Apple participates in that. The stock chart is really impressive, particularly at the end of the year. And so I think these price target heights are probably just some of more to come. It, when you look at in the, the the AirPods, one yeah. of the most popular items. Sold out so, this Christmas. Exactly. M- multiple months backlog, I think, of that, that new one now. One of the hottest items this Christmas. So really reigniting the wearables category. I remember, guys, I mean, Robert, when I first, that, when that revenue downgrade or that revenue forecast downgrade happened yeah. last year yeah. yep. with Apple, I kept thinking to myself, oh my God, this is the beginning. Yeah. It's Nokia and Ericsson yeah. all over again. Yeah. And it couldn't be anything further from the truth, right? Yeah. No, I mean, just in the past month, they've gained $180 billion in market cap. And what have they announced? Uh, nothing, nothing, really. Nothing. Right. nothing. And even these analyst reports, you look at them today, and I was trying to find something that was new and there, you know, one, we did some scraping of Twitter and found that mentions of the Apple iPhone of the iPhone 11 were pretty good. Okay, but <laughs> but so there's really nothing levitating this stock except for Apple is still Apple. People love their stuff. And hey, I, I got a question for you. Oh, a pointed question for you. You are you going to buy an Apple, a new iPhone <laughs> this year because of the rollout of 5G wireless? Because no. that's what everyone's waiting the super for, cycle, right? right? Yeah. No, I don't think I will. My phone's just shut off, and I need one for a long time now. And I keep telling myself, I'll wait, I'll wait, I'll wait, because I'm always waiting for a better camera. I'm not as concerned with 5G, but the camera is supposed to be amazing on this. Yeah. And I think that actually brings us full circle to what I was thinking about the social media mentions. Is that I think that that camera matters so much more now than it ever has before True. because of social media and how much emphasis people put on amazing photos for their online profiles. So I think while it may seem silly that there are more mentions of it online, I do think it actually went Mine just got paid off on the installment. Look at that. I don't want to see the only reason why that. I bought wow. it. You, you guys were all know, out as well. Like you guys I was. all know that I had a yeah. six for the longest yeah. time. Yeah. I didn't want to upgrade, but finally was convinced by one of our assistant managing editors, Elizabeth Cordova, that I'm doing my child a disservice by not taking good photos of <laughs> and them. The fact oh, you the, can't take a bad photo right. of her. Yeah, you can't. She's, the, she's adorable. And the battery probably didn't work on the six either. I know, right? Well, that's, yeah, mine keeps anyway. dying. All right, so <laughs> moving on from Apple here. Next up, we got the battle over L Brands. First up, Bank of America upgrading the stock to a buy from neutral, saying the company has multiple options to create value. The upgrade boosting the stock more than 8% for its best day since November, as you can see there in the chart. In just the last hour, this is pretty funny, Jeffrey's analysts out with a note telling their clients the shares are up on a competitor's upgrade and to now use today's rally... <laughs> to exit those L Brands positions. So the other analysts now has to come back and say it's even more attractive now that there's a <laughs> downgrade. <laughs> exactly. It is pretty rare to see that that back and forth. But when you look at the L Brands business, they've got Victoria's Secret and they've got Bath and Body Works. And the performance has been pretty divergent for some time. We don't really need to belabor the point that Victoria's Secret has been through its share of struggles. They exited the swim business, which in hindsight looks like it was a mistake. They're struggling with sort of their marketing and their brand image. Bath and Body Works, on the other, on the other hand, is still very popular and Anecdotally, I saw more Bath and Body Works bags on Black Friday than anyone else. It had a very busy store. I think it was a three-for-one promotion. People are still really into Bath and Body Works. And Les Wechner and L Brands has a very good history of spinning out companies at the right points, even when it doesn't feel like it for the market when you look back. I don't know what that means here, um, but I think there's some interesting analyst diverging views at a point when the stock has really shed a lot. So, of Kate, I mean, would you are you a shopper? Would you shop there? What would change so your I image was, about shopping? I was shocked about Bed Bath. Uh, Bath and Body Works yes. still being so popular. I had absolutely no idea. But I'm so curious, Court, from your opinion, just about the turnaround of Victoria's Secret. I know one of the things that they've struggled with is this inclusivity thing that they kind of really missed the boat on. They canceled the fashion show. No more swim line. I mean, like, is that a brand that you can rehab? What happens next? I have, I have an interesting way of thinking about this. I think you could rehab the brand. But I actually think that a brand is allowed to be what a brand wants to be. Sure. And I actually don't think that it is necessarily wrong if they decide they want 
to be sexy. I know that may not be popular. Unless it's just not right. profitable anymore, which Absol- is, it Absolutely. can't be that brand Look at anymore. the Aerie business. Like, they've done amazing because they did the exact you're opposite right. of what Victoria's Secret you're done. T- so I'm just curious if they'll I'm ever... totally right. So I, I, I guess my point is I think you can find success in one or the other, mm-hmm. and I think they need to figure out which way they're going to go yeah. because right now it seems like they might be trying to straddle both, and I don't think that works. All right, mm-hmm. so speaking of trying to figure out where they're going to go, let's talk mm-hmm. about topic three because it's New York. It's making a new name for itself as the city that never sells, believe it or not. The average sale price in the fourth quarter for real estate in New York fell 8% to $1.8 million. That marks New York City's eighth straight quarter of declines. Robert, could this year be any different? Or no. is this just a stalling out of Manhattan values in general? Yeah, so it's one of the great paradoxes of our time. Right? We have a record high stock market, except for today's a little softer, but we have an incredible economy. We have all these tech companies moving to New York City. Everyone's working, apparently. Everyone's working. All these tech companies are hiring people, adding space. This should be boom time for real estate, and it's now two years straight. If you look at the supply of new development, there is a six-year supply of new wow. condos in New York City now. So you look at that supply, and 2,000 more condos coming on the market this year. Price is going down 8% just in the quarter. Maybe it will turn around or stabilize at some point, but the numbers suggest it's not going to be in 2020. What's the biggest driver of that weakness, Robert, uh, just over the last two years? So it's really two things. It's the tax issue with the salt taxes and the mansion tax that they just added in New York City. And it's, it's the fact that you don't have foreign buyers, and there was so much supply at the top, giant new luxury condos priced at eight ten thousand dollars $10,000 a square foot that people just don't want to buy anymore. But this so is, it's oversupply and taxes. But the, the high end is still selling, right? So it's not like that's skewing the average. No, I see a penthouse no. going for like $100 million now the, or something the, else so like that. So we had a spate of deals that were at the very high end because those went into contract four years ago. Now the buildings are done. Mm. So those are actually deals that, that are sort of tracers from the past. But if you look at what's on the market now, the top sales above $5 million were down 40% wow. in the quarter. So the top is hurting. All right. Mm. The big deal for New York real estate, guys. Now, finally, this is an interesting one, only because it's the new year. <laughs> we're so Brewers, curious. Brewers, <laughs> brewers, alcoholic brewers are starting to embrace Dry January as a concept, uh, looking to cash in on the growing sober curious movement. Despite beer volumes, I know this is, this is something. Yeah. I, apparently, this is something. Look I'm at not that curious graphic. about being sober. Volumes in the U.S. <laughs> for beer are falling 1.6% in 2018. The fifth fastest growing type of beer is no and low alcohol beer. Can I discuss? I have a th- I have thoughts. Okay. So I did a whole 30 last January and I'm going to do it again this January. Explain and you, what can, that is. you, yes, you basically like, like deprive yourself of everything but you sleep you really well, your energy's great, you have no sugar, no dairy, no alcohol. You're starving. So I did a dry January essentially. No, you can eat a lot. We'll talk more oh, offline. Okay. You can eat a lot but it's all whole nutritious okay. foods. It's supposed to be very good for you. It's kind of like a reset detox thing. You can't drink on it. I would never think to buy a non-alcoholic beer just because What's the point? I mean, I'm like, like, like either you're going to drink or you're like not going to drink. No, I don't, I don't enjoy the taste that much, it's to be like, honest. So. It's like acoustic Metallica. Like, you just, <laughs> you just don't want it. And, you know, beer just doesn't taste great. Now, that's why we've seen so many people go to the Spike Seltzers and all the mm-hmm. things that actually taste okay and have some alcoholic content. This is the worst of both worlds. You get the taste of beer, beer without, without a it. buzz. Yeah. I mean, Courtney... <laughs> You're a you're a good wholesome Midwestern girl. Beer drinker. Who loves beer? Just say it. You're a beer drinker. I, I mean, does it resonate with you at all? This idea that you can you, you want the, all of the benefit of taste, but none of the buzz or the calories. I'm sorry, I don't get it. To each his own. But like, I want a full real beer. None of this dry-ish January. I understand there's you know some marketing campaigns by some of these beer makers to try to go dry-ish because it's low calorie. All right, fine. Low calorie, fine, but. Alcohol's got to be there. It's kind of part of the reason. No? All right, let's let's end this here. Your drink of choice, alcoholic. Mm-hmm. Corona. All right, your drink of choice. Scotch. All right, your drink of choice. Rosé. All right, wine, beer, and liquor all together at once. Kate Rogers, Robert Frank, Courtney Reagan. Happy Friday. Happy Friday. Happy Friday. Friday. We're We're right now. Right now. This. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Well, stocks falling after the U.S. airstrike in Iraq, but one asset is climbing on the news, and it's not gold. We'll tell you what it is. That's coming up next. Jenny Craig is so easy. Every day. Boredom. Fitness enemy number one. So don't just run. 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 Mix it up. Skip. Run. Skip.
skip, run, give yourself a lift, mix, mix it up, lift, mix it up, run, lift, splash, skip, lift, run. It's crunch time. Skip, mix, mix it up, run, mix it up. Add a boxing class. Skip, run, splash, skip, run. Mix it up at Virgin Active and get stronger, fitter, faster. Join now for 12 months and pay nothing in January. T's and C's apply. Run, mix, mix it up, skip, mix it run, mix it, mix it. To LeBron, slam dunk! The NBA is on TuneIn Premium. Each week, TuneIn picks an NBA game you just can't miss. Hard pulls back, trying to make it 11 to 2. The Pelicans are taking on the Lakers in Los Angeles for the first time since the big off-season trade, sending Anthony Davis to L.A. Today, the Pelicans are at the Lakers. Tip-off is at 10.30 p.m. Eastern. Search NBA on TuneIn to follow your favorite NBA team today. You might already know that TuneIn allows you to listen to all the pro sports leagues wherever you go. But did you know TuneIn is also home to the wide world of college sports? Open three, DeAndre Hunter got it! And off Carruthers, big hole right side. He leaps and he surges in, touchdown! From live college football, basketball, and baseball games to podcasts and coaches shows fueling your love for the game and your school. And the best part is, it's all free. Search college sports to find your team or league. Welcome back to The Exchange. There's gold as a safe haven, and then there's Bitcoin, the cryptocurrency jumping 4% in the wake of that U.S. airstrike that killed Iran's top military commander, now trading up more than 6% there for Bitcoin prices. That marks a sharp turnaround following a tumultuous six months where Bitcoin had dropped below the 7,000 mark. It does, again, continue to just hover around 7,352 right now. Well, coming up, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo telling his foreign relations counterparts the U.S. is committed to de-escalation in the Middle East, what both the U.S. allies and adversaries have to say about last night's airstrike. That's coming up next. The Exchange is now a podcast. Listen to your favorite parts of the show you might have missed. Sign up now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and Google Podcasts. If you listen to the political debate in this country... This is not a commercial. This is a reminder. With TuneIn Premium, you could be listening to more music commercial-free. Get over 45 commercial-free music stations. Visit TuneIn.com slash premium to upgrade. We can't make traffic move faster during rush hour. (laughs) But we can help you catch up on the news with TuneIn with live around-the-clock news from MSNBC. In the UK, they're significantly worse. When the president gets up to the podium... CNBC and Fox News Talk. The Fox News poll sizing up the race for 2020 found that each of the five top... You can use your stop and go for good by staying in touch with the world. Search news to hear what's happening now. Introducing a new podcast, ESPN Daily. When you want to go beyond your feed... When you want to get inside the score, when you want to get behind the highlight, there's ESPN Daily. Go deeper into the stories of the moment. Get the exclusive access and insider perspective that only ESPN can give you. ESPN Daily, hosted by me, Mina Kimes. Listen now to ESPN Daily on TuneIn. Want to hear about the latest and greatest things to listen to on TuneIn? For reminders of the biggest live sports games, debates, and breaking news stories, follow at TuneIn on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to stay connected with the audio that matters to you. You love TuneIn for live breaking news from CNN, MSNBC, Fox, CNBC, and more. But when you can't catch your favorite show as it airs, it might just be a click away as a podcast. Search your favorite news station to explore all the on-demand news shows on TuneIn. Are you curious what others are listening to on TuneIn? Head to the trending section under Browse to see the most popular stations and podcasts among TuneIn listeners right now. Check it out. You might just discover something new for yourself. Don't want to miss a second of the NFL playoffs? Set reminders with TuneIn to stay in sync with the postseason. Just make sure notifications are allowed on your phone and search for your team on the TuneIn app. Find the game you want to hear and tap Notify Me. We'll let you know exactly when live coverage begins. Cutting for the net, scores! On the goal line, Marshawn scores! 
hockey fans, the 2019-20 NHL season is here. And tucks it home! And with this team, it's it's really fun to be a part of a team like that. You can hear the action live on TuneIn Premium. From regular season action to the All-Star Game and through the Stanley Cup in June. Hear the home and away call for every game for every team live. At home or on the go, never miss a game with the NHL on TuneIn Premium. Upgrade today. President Trump defending the airstrike in Baghdad, which killed Iranian General Qasem Soleimani. The president said Soleimani was responsible for the deaths of millions of people and should have been taken out many years ago. How will allies and enemies of the U.S. respond to the military action? Joining us now is Michael O'Hanlon, senior fellow and director of research in foreign policy at the Brookings Institution. Michael, thank you very much for being here today. How important is Soleimani's killing and will it reshape policy? in the Middle East. Good afternoon. Well, it's certainly going to have a lot of impact on the U.S. relationship with Iran and also with Iraq. Let me start with Iraq, if I could, because that's the one that I am most worried about. Obviously, we're headed for some difficult times with Iran. We've already had them, and they will continue. But with Iraq, of course, we've got 5,000 U.S. troops in that country. That's sort of how this whole thing began, in some sense, when the When the Iranian-sponsored militia started attacking our military facilities, we retaliated. Then the Soleimani episode occurred. And now the Iraqis are thinking seriously of booting us out. And that would be a reflection of their passions, their feeling of an infringement of sovereignty. But I think it would be a big mistake for them and for us because it would create a power vacuum that Iran could then move into inside of Iraq. So you got to watch that. That's the biggest thing that's going to happen next, in my opinion, even bigger than the likely response of Iran by using violence. I think Iran will have to do something, but it's always doing something. This may be a little bit more, uh, but I'm most concerned about whether we can preserve somehow this U.S.-Iraq security partnership that's been so crucial, and without which I think Iraq is not going to be able to withstand Iran's greater influence, and may not be able to withstand another attempt by ISIS or al-Qaeda to establish some caliphate territory in parts of the country. All right, so, so Michael, let's talk a little bit about the, the idea here that it's been a proxy war so far, right? It's been Iran-backed elements in Syria or in Lebanon or in places like militias in Iraq. How, how much does this escalate from a proxy war to one where it could be straight on between the U.S. and Iran? The latter is not super likely because Iran knows it doesn't do well in that showdown. But Iran does quite well, as you're aware, in covert and proxy activities. And of the cases that you mentioned, and you could also add Yemen, I suppose, to the list, and maybe even one or two others, Iraq is different in the sense that it has a functioning government. It's not a particularly stable country, and we know that very well, and it's been through a lot. But it has a government, and that government wants to work, up until now at least, with the United States as well as with Iran. So we've been trying to create this balancing act, if you will, make sure that Iraq is not purely in the Iranian camp. And I think we've been partly successful in the last few years under both President Obama and President Trump. Now that whole thing's at jeopardy, because again, if we are booted out, then I think the Iraqi government has a harder time fending off Iranian activities, subterfuges, et cetera, and also becomes more vulnerable to sectarian tension and to terrorism. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit about the, the, the balancing act that the U.S. has right now, because the U.S. still does have a significant amount of military might and forces in the region. I think right. the Fifth Fleet is based out of Bahrain. So you've got the entire Fifth Fleet in the Navy, in the Gulf, operating there. You've got troops on the ground in places like Iraq, still in Afghanistan, maybe even small forces in Syria at this point right now. How exactly does U.S. military policy then evolve, given the fact that this has happened with Soleimani? By the way, you're right on all of that, and I would add a very important additional uh, airfield in Qatar, the Al Udaid Air Base, which is one of the biggest air bases we have in the entire world, from which we send a lot of combat sorties and logistics sorties throughout the whole region. So there are about a half dozen different places where we've got some capacity. In that sense, our regional footprint does not go away even if we're kicked out of Iraq. I'm not overly concerned about that. But the Syria presence would be jeopardized because it does depend to a large extent on logistical support from U.S. forces in either Iraq or Turkey. And, uh, and then, of course, Iran just begins to consolidate 
a bridge all gotcha. the way from its own territory to the Mediterranean. So those are the big downsides if we have to leave Iraq. All right, big deal for sure. Lots of ripple effects. Michael Hanlon of Brookings, thank you very much. Thank well, you. still ahead, a look at Iran's cyber attack strategy. Speaking of strategies, in retaliation for last night's attack, that company, that, that comes up next. The company's most at risk. We'll talk about those. NFL playoffs are here. Make sure you don't miss a minute of this year's postseason action by setting a reminder on TuneIn. Just make sure notifications are allowed on your phone and search for your team on the TuneIn app. Find the game you want to hear and tap Notify Me. We'll send you an alert just in time for kickoff. We can't make traffic move faster during rush hour. But we can help you catch up on the news with TuneIn with live around-the-clock news from MSNBC. In the U.K., they're significantly worse. When the president gets up yeah. to the podium... CNBC got... and Fox News Talk. The Fox News poll sizing up the race for 2020 found that each of the five top... Democrats... You can use your stop-and-go for good by staying in touch with the world. Search news to hear what's happening now. Upgrade to TuneIn Premium and get over 45 commercial-free music stations. You'll also get live commercial-free news, plus live play-by-play games from NFL, MLB, NBA, and NHL. Visit TuneIn.com slash premium to upgrade. Want to hear about the latest and greatest things to listen to on TuneIn? For reminders of the biggest live sports games, debates, and breaking news stories, follow at TuneIn on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to stay connected with the audio that matters to you. Hockey fans, the 2019-20 NHL season is here. Here's Petrangelo, he scores! the action live on TuneIn Premium. And a move, and a shot, From regular season action to the All-Star Game and through the Stanley Cup in June. Hear the home and away call for every game, for every team live. At home or on the go, never miss a game with the NHL on TuneIn Premium. Upgrade today. You might already know that TuneIn allows you to listen to all the pro sports leagues wherever you go. But did you know TuneIn is also home to the wide world of college sports? Open three, DeAndre Hunter got it! Hand off Carruthers, big hole right side. He leaps and he surges in, touchdown. From live college football, basketball, and baseball games to podcasts and coaches shows fueling your love for the game and your school. And the best part is, it's all free. Search college sports to find your team or league. Pascal gobbles up the rebound and slams it down. Catch your favorite NBA team right here on TuneIn. A step back, D3 is up and in. Search NBA on TuneIn and hear all the action. The NBA lives on TuneIn. If you're looking for a bright spot, check out cybersecurity stocks right behind me. A relative bright spot today, CrowdStrike, FireEye, Fortinet, all gaining some as anticipation over Iran's retaliation efforts against the U.S. is killing, again, one of major the major generals, Qasem Soleimani, with a cyber attack. Will they retaliate in that way? Iran has been honing its cyber capabilities, and as tensions reach a fever pitch, businesses in America may become a prime target. CNBC.com technology reporter Kate Fazzini joins us now with the details of that story. There's a reason why all of these stocks behind us were in the green today. Why is it that cyber is now such a huge focus? It's funny because I've been on the phone with representatives from these companies um, today, throughout the day, and one of the major things that they heard starting just a few minutes after the news broke of this, uh, this killing were calls from their financial services clients, particularly saying, what does this mean for us? Now, why is that? Because in the past, Iran has shown that they will retaliate against things like sanctions by attacking large financial institutions in the United States and sometimes taking their websites offline. So the banking infrastructure is going to be front and center as a risk point for this. Where else could we expect to see it? We have often heard people saying that maybe the electrical grid or our our country's infrastructure from a, a power standpoint is at risk. Are all of those at play right now, given what we've seen with Iran? I don't think so. I believe that because... A, an attack on infrastructure like that. Now, we know that Iran has had some positions on U.S. dams. We know that from some intelligence reports that have come out over the last several years. But that is a little bit too risky for them. What is less risky is hiding behind some of the hacker collectives that they have hid behind in the past. When you have a group of people who are, let's say, attacking a U.S. bank, and they say they're doing it for ideological reasons, they're hacktivists, as they sometimes call themselves, it gives Iran a little distance, a little 
a potentially buffer. a buffer, exactly, a little plausible deniability to say, well, it, it wasn't state-sponsored just to maybe cool things off. That is really, I think, what most experts are saying they would expect to see here. So with this Iran situation, I, I know that the, the, the Revolutionary Guard there has kind of its own little cyber division or force. You mentioned the proxies, these hacktivist-type groups that they'll use or employ or finance or fund to do this. I, I'm wondering how much more this emboldens perhaps hackers in other jurisdictions as well. I think maybe China, I think North Korea, others around the world. Is that going to be a threat as well because of what happened, a ripple effect, if you will? That's a really interesting question, and you're, you're absolutely right. Um, a ripple effect maybe isn't the right term, but uh, kind of a smoke screen. Whenever there's a lot of cyber activity happening from one country against another, it gives third countries or other nation states the ability to say, well, they're not going to be paying attention to me right now. I can slip in and get the stuff that I've been wanting to get for a long time. They're, they're ramping up against somebody else. So just a couple seconds left yeah. here. The companies that, you speak, yeah, that you've spoken to, how concerned are they? Uh, they're, they're very concerned. They're less concerned about a serious attack. They think it'll be probably something proxy-related. All right. Kate Fazzini, thank you very much for that. Thanks. It's a huge story for sure, given everything that's happened in Iran overnight. Well, everybody, that does it for The Exchange. I wish you guys all a pleasant Friday. Power Lunch begins right now. Tom, thank you very much, and very welcome, everybody, to a very special edition of Power Lunch. The markets are down more than 200 points as the U.S., as you probably know, uh, takes out a major general, Qasem Soleimani, in an overnight airstrike. Uh, more on that in a second. We are, however, just getting the minutes from the last Federal Reserve meeting. They come out right now, and Diana Olick has them. Die. Tyler, there was considerable agreement in the December minutes about the reasons behind calling the federal funds rate currently appropriate. As you may recall, the vote was unanimous to keep rates unchanged. Participants agreed that the labor market was strong and economic activity had risen at a moderate rate during the period. Some noted the labor force participation rate could rise further, while some indicated payroll gains would show less momentum in the coming year. They generally expected sustained expansion of the economy and inflation near the committee's 2% objective. They agreed that spending had increased at a strong pace, and many noted that contacts in consumer-related industries were reported strong demand for the holiday season. Now, trade came up an awful lot, of course, 18 times for those of you counting, with participants noticing that, noting that uncertainty over trade and weakness in economic growth abroad continued to pose some risks to their outlook. They also expressed concern about activity in manufacturing industry, industries. Some participants commented on challenges to the energy and agriculture sectors, but a couple noted that federal farm subsidies were offsetting some of the strain on farmers. As for risk, many saw it tilted to the downside, but some risks were seen to have eased, in particular, again, trade tensions with China, and the probability of a no-deal Brexit was judged to have lessened further, and they noted that that gave market sentiment a boost. And as for policy going forward, some concerns were raised that keeping interest rates low for a long time might encourage excessive risk-taking in the financial sector, but some said maintaining the current stance could be helpful for cushioning the U.S. economy from global risk. And then there was this little tricky thing on language at the end in the statement. They actually struggled with how to phrase the two percent language. Some thought saying, quote, near 2 percent could be misinterpreted as suggesting that policymakers were comfortable with inflation running below that. They preferred language that referred to returning inflation to the committee's 2 percent objective. And in the end, they actually used both of those terms. Back to you guys. <laughs> they just couldn't decide. Diana, thank you very much. We're going to turn now to the other big story that's affecting the markets today, the U.S. killing of top Iranian commander Qasem Salami in an airstrike in Baghdad. Amon Javers has the latest. Hi, Amon. Yeah, that's right. A couple of new developments here in Washington to bring you up to speed on here. <clears throat> As the Pentagon is now saying, additional U.S. troops are going to the region. About 3,500 troops, they say, from the 82nd Airborne uh, will be repositioned here to the Middle East, according to uh, folks over at the Pentagon. And also here yeah, in, on Capitol Hill, Mitch McConnell, a Republican Senate leader, uh, suggesting that the administration is now arranging a classified briefing for all senators uh, early next week. They say there's going to be a staff-level briefing before that, but all senators will have access to classified information about exactly what went on here as we still <clears throat> try to fill in some of the gaps about what happened in this attack, what it was that the United States saw in terms of the intelligence threat information that it was responding to and what this Iranian general may have been up to in Baghdad as the U.S. Uh, military honed in on him uh, late last night. So at this point, we're expecting to see the president at about 5 p.m. <clears throat> this evening. He's going to be speaking 
at an evangelical event down in Florida where he's been on vacation. Uh, it's possible, though, that he'll top those comments uh, with some comments explaining the rationale here for this strike and sort of what the president expects to see next as sort of the military and foreign policy establishment here in Washington braces for some kind of response from the Iranians. Where that is and what how that will uh, take place, still TBD, no indication of any response just yet, though, guys. All right, Eamon, thank you very much. Let's get the market reaction to all this news, and it keeps coming from Bob Pisani at the New York Stock Exchange. Hi, Bob. Hello, Tyler. And uh, just a, a point on the Fed minutes. The, the key takeaway here is, remember Jay Powell's press conference? He said that it would take a sustained increase in inflation for the Fed to go back to raising interest rates. That was the key takeaway from the meeting, I think, also from the Fed minutes as well. Taking a look at the markets here, uh, you saw the hit to energy early on. We saw a nice move up in some of the exploration production names like Apache and Devon. But here's something very interesting. The big global integrated names didn't move much at all. And in fact, some of them, like Exxon and Chevron, actually moved down now in the middle of the day. If this was 10 or 15 years ago, that certainly would not happen. Rather interesting bifurcation there. Defense stocks, though, never really dropped at all. We've got new record highs on Lockheed Martin and Northrop Grumman uh, as well moving up here today. Uh, there you see them. Put back the Dow movers here because I just want to know the cyclicals like 3M and Caterpillar have generally remained weak on the day, as have the bank names. Remember, we saw yields moving up, uh, of, uh, yields moving down, pardon me, as we saw prices moving up in bonds. That's just a, a defensive play overall. Airlines, of course, you get some pressure here. That's a sort of knee-jerk reaction. But again, a very different situation than it might have been years ago. I think this might be a little overdone. That's because the effect of oil on these companies, the cost for uh, oil, is much lower than it used to be overall. If you look at the cost for a typical airline today, maybe 35% is labor, 10 to 15% is fuel, and the rest, 55% include taxes and just maintenance costs. Fuel would have been 20 25% under some situations situations 15 or 20 years ago, Courtney, and good indication that oil doesn't have exactly the influence on the U.S. economy that it used to. Back that to is you. interesting, Bob, and does suggest perhaps a bit of an overreaction in the sell-off in airline stocks. Thank you. Well, let's get more reaction now to both the escalating tensions with Iran and the Fed minutes. As the markets look to be really shaking off the worst of it, we're just down about seven-tenths of a percent here on the Dow. Let's bring in John Augustine. He's chief investment officer with Huntington Private Bank, and Gus Fauché. He's chief economist with PNC. Also with us, Ron Insana, senior advisor to Schroeder's North America, and CNBC market analyst. And Ron, maybe I should just start there with you. I mean, it doesn't seem like for a series of a news event as this is that the markets are really selling off too sharply. I mean, seven tenths of a percent, eight tenths of a percent. That's not so severe after the run I mean, that we've seen. Twenty-eight thousand, you know, two hundred point drop in the Dow is a regular day for all intents and purposes. And, and yeah, and we've come off the lows and oils come off the highs. I, you know, I do, I do think there is a bit of a suspension of disbelief about the seriousness of this particular event when you listen to geopolitical strategists, of which I am not one. They have suggested that this type of decapitation move is is a different style assault than we have seen between the United States and Iran over the last many years and could lead to more serious consequences down the road. So I don't think the market can price that in all in one day, and we don't know what the outcome is, and we don't know what the seriousness of this will all be. But it does look like a, a, a rather noted escalated, escalation in tensions between the two countries. So there was the shock reaction, if you will, this morning. Even that wasn't that large. I mean, it was up 4%. And as Bob pointed out and others throughout the day have suggested, this would have been a you know, $10, $15, $20 rally in oil, $30, $40 rally in gold, big drop in stocks. It's not what we're seeing today, but I, I don't think we're quite out of the woods with respect to geopolitical risk quite yet. And, John, if we look at specifically then at the energy patch with some of this, we are seeing crude oil prices up about 3%. But then when you look actually at the energy sector, not much movement down just a bit. And I know energy has really underperformed. How does this play into the broader understanding, your understanding of the energy market and what we could be in for in 2020? Well, the, what caught our attention today, Courtney, was actually in the futures market because the, the cash market took oil up a couple of percent, but the futures market did not. So the futures market does not see this in, in oil as a long-term condition where with rising oil prices, at least at this time, so it really wasn't a surprise to us to see energy, as Bob talked about, a lot of those stocks move lower. We might suggest if the, if the futures market is correct, lower prices in the future for crude oil, that we may see some investors actually trim energy positions if we see a further rise in the cash price. 
Gus, if I can turn to you and talk a bit about the Fed minutes, of course, both pieces of news being digested by the market at the same time, the news overseas, as well as the minutes that we just got from that latest Fed meeting. The Fed looks like sort of taking their time to evaluate the economy. But I think we would be remiss not to understand that the Fed was very supportive of this market in the last year. Going forward, what are your expectations for the Fed? Will they sit in neutral or are we looking at perhaps one move or more? Uh, right now, I don't expect to see the Fed cut rates in 2020. So monetary policy is mildly positive for growth, mildly positive for stocks right now. Uh, there is still a great deal of uncertainty out there, but uh, as the Fed minutes noticed, it, it did lessen. Uh, that being said, obviously, the, the attack in Iraq has is, is increased uncertainty. But I think the Fed wants to see how things will play out, and they're comfortable now keeping the Fed funds rate where it is in that range between one and a half and one and three quarters percent. You know, Ron, maybe I missed it yesterday, but, but not many, check that, not any of the market uh, thinkers that I spoke to yesterday mentioned Iran at all. Uh, right. That's obviously changed now in 24 hours. The question is, how does the hierarchy of risks change, and does, this year, does, the, does the risk rating, hard for me to pronounce, intensify markedly because of this for the year 2020? Well, it's an open question on, on the marketly part, uh, Tyler. I think, you know, the Council on Foreign Relations re released its risk assessment for the year. Thirteen different hot spots, the most we've seen in quite some time. Proxy war with Iran being in the top five, as we've heard throughout the day. And so, yeah, I think the geopolitical risk matrix rises uh, and becomes more intense. Political risk, both at home and abroad, is slightly higher as well. It's an election year, as we well know. So I think the, the hierarchy of risks moves away from, let's say, Fed tightening, which I think is not right. likely in 2020, right. and towards these other events, the, the election here at home. Now, geopolitical risk may have jumped to the top. You know, we still have North Korea to contend with. We have other spots, Russia and China, where we have not resolved issues yet. And so I do think this may be a m more important turning point than people recognize at the moment. Gus, what do I do with this news of the last 24 hours in terms of my portfolio, if anything? I, I think you hold steady and you see where things are going. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty out there right now. I think it would be a mistake to react too quickly. I do think that energy prices are likely to stabilize. We continue to see the U.S. being the swing producer, so I expect to see higher production in the United States. But as of right now, I just set, sit pat and, and see how things play out. John, as we take a look at what's going on in the bond market right now, we're sitting at the 10-year at 1.8 in yields. Do you think we're closer to 1.5 or 2.5 in 2020? Uh, we would say 2.5. We're in the camp where our economic team thinks we're going to see a build in the U.S. economy this year. We're going to see a build in U.S. corporate profits this year from the low levels that we saw at the end of last year. So we would say 2.5 before 1.5 in the bond market with what we know today. We just don't know if we're going to have those geopolitical events as Ron was talking about pick up or not. Keeps us balanced, keeps us diversified, keeps us active in our stance for our customers. John, do you have any recommendations for individual stock picks here going into the new year for investors looking to add to their portfolios? Um, we would say barbell. So for instance, on our equity team, the last issues that they added to the portfolios that we run internally, we came back into NVIDIA, chip stock, global growth to us. Then we also came back into Procter & Gamble and Stryker and healthcare, so more of the defensive issues. So it was, it's a barbell condition for us. That's what we're bringing to 2020 on our equity team. And that's why we're just trying to stay balanced and diversified in our portfolio conduct. But th just to give you some stock ideas there, Courtney. Thank you, gentlemen. We're going to leave it there for today. John Augustine, Gus Boshe, and Ron Insana. Coming up, much more reaction to the killing of Iran's top military general by U.S. forces. Iran promising harsh retaliation. What can we expect and where? We will look at what could happen now when we return. Listen, we know we'll have enough retirement money to survive. Next time you look up at the stars, think about this. Inside you are the remains of a stellar explosion. You are made of stardust. And without the stars, there wouldn't be us. I'm Guy Raj, the wonders of the universe and the people who still look up every night. Next time on the TED Radio Hour from NPR. You can subscribe to the TED Radio Hour on TuneIn. When you're not listening to your team, take it to the end zone, the rim, or the net. 
Keep up with the biggest moments in sports by following TuneIn on social media. And a block, hook, into the end zone for the touchdown. From reminders of the live top games to tips of the best sports stations and podcasts. Welcome to Undisputed. We are live from Los Angeles. I'm Jenny Taft here with Skip Bates. Follow at TuneIn on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to get the most out of TuneIn. Want to know a quick, easy way to see if your favorite podcasts have a new episode available? Just go to the home screen on your TuneIn app and see the latest additions under the Your New Episode section. Happy listening. Introducing a new podcast, ESPN Daily. When you want to go beyond your feed, when you want to get inside the score, when you want to get behind the highlight, there's ESPN Daily. Go deeper into the stories of the moment. Get the exclusive access and insider perspective that only ESPN can give you. ESPN Daily, hosted by me, Mina Kimes. Listen now to ESPN Daily on TuneIn. Pascal gobbles up the rebound and slams it down. Get your favorite NBA team right here on TuneIn. A step back, D3 is up and in. Search NBA on TuneIn and hear all the action. The NBA lives on TuneIn. Hey, NFL fan, can't watch the game? Can't be there? No biggie. With your TuneIn Premium membership, you already have an all-access pass to every team and every game in the league. Amazing, right? Steps up, floats it towards at the goal line, it's intercepted! Listen live as the action unfolds, or on demand when you can. Anytime, anywhere, all season long. Right side, it is caught, it is in for the right side for the touchdown. Again. Search NFL today. Welcome back to Power Launch. Global tensions are high today as Iran's top military commander, General Soleimani, was killed last night in a U.S. drone strike at the Baghdad airport. News sent shockwaves across the world as the Iranian government promised harsh retaliation. So what can we expect if the conflict between D.C. and Tehran further escalates? Joining our panel is Daniel Dresner, professor of international politics at the Fletcher School of Law at Tufts, and John Gans, Director of Communications and Research at the University of Pennsylvania's Perry World House. And Ron Insana is also here with us. Uh, gentlemen, let me just ask you, of all the retaliations that the United States could have brought to bear, and I'll start with you, Daniel, if I might, of all the retaliations that the United States could have brought to bear, where does this one rank in terms of its provocativeness and in terms of what it might bring? Um, I think we can honestly say it's unprecedented. About the only thing that would have been more provocative uh, than this attack is if they had uh, targeted Soleimani while Soleimani was in Iran uh, rather than being in Iraq. Um, but you are killing a Iranian state official, an Iranian state official that is responsible for an awful lot of terrorism and mayhem across the Middle East, but nonetheless a state official. Um, and furthermore, the administration announced that this is what it's done. Uh, there's no denying the, uh, the culpability of the United States on this. So this is a significant escalation um, in the sense of what's done. Admittedly, Soleimani and, and Iraqi proxies have been responsible for the deaths of, of hundreds of American soldiers um, and other servicemen in Iraq. Uh, but this is a, another level. Let me ask you, John, is this what you would describe as a seismic event in the Middle East? That's number one. And number two, is it fair to call it, number one, a declaration of war, or number two, merely an act of war on our part? Well, it's a good question in terms of the size. I think one of the things that makes it feel bigger is is that it's a, it's a bit of a zig from where I think a lot of people were expecting Donald Trump to zag. We've seen sort of a sort of cycle of tit for tat, escalation, de-escalation with Iran, really over the sort of whole course of his presidency so far. And if you recall, earlier this year, he actually turned down an attack because he thought, you know, any loss of life following an attack on an American drone would not be proportional. So I think most people and most people would not have been able to predict 
predict a week ago when an American and contractor was killed in Iraq that we would end up here. So I think that that added to the surprise element, to the sort of size and scope mm -hmm. of the impact of this in terms of relations in the in the Middle East. In terms of active war versus sort of uh, you know uh, anything along those lines, definitions. I think most people would admit we've been in a proxy war with Iran for a very long time, going back in some ways decades. Um, and so I think that what we see is this is another sort of stage in that attack, in that sort of war, as well as another sort of an escalation of that war. So the question I think everybody needs to be spending some time with is what's going to happen next? Dan, I, I want to go back to sort of what you've said about how this might have been a bigger event if it would have happened in Iran. But just in general, why did this happen now? I understand we have had other opportunities potentially to take out the general. Well, to be fair, we don't entirely know why this happened now. I mean, according to Secretary of State Pompeo, he said that there was an imminent threat uh, against U.S. interests uh, in Iraq. Um, we don't have any confirmation of that. We have to take his word for it. There needs to be a lot more information made available about what exactly was going on. But clearly the implication was um, that there was had been some tit-for-tat escalation, as John said uh, previously, and that this was presumably a way in which the United States could establish what is called escalation dominance, which is that there was nothing that the Iranians will potentially do in response that would be as potentially severe as this. Whether that's actually the case uh, is a legitimate question. There are a variety of ways in which Iran can retaliate asymmetrically, particularly in the region. Um, but if we take Secretary Pompeo at his word, uh, then we have to believe that there was an imminent threat um, posed on U.S. interests, particularly in Iraq. We don't have any more information than that, though. I want to come back to the idea of, the, of, of Iran's ret probable retaliation and the form it might take. But, Ron, I want to come back to something I asked in the prior segment and didn't ask very well. So I'm going to take another whack at it. How much riskier did the world just become? How much riskier have the markets just become because of what happened over the last 24 hours? Well, I think we will now be underpricing geopolitical risk for some time to become, and I do believe the, the world is riskier because of this. I mean, to, to deconstruct what transpired, Soleimani goes back to the 1979 revolution. He was a state official, as was said, since the Ayatollah Khomeini was around, now with the Ayatollah Khomeini, he is effectively the number two leader in Iran. So we just you know, assassinated or killed however you want the to second characterize most it, the second most person powerful person in, in Iran, which again, as was said, uh, is, is an unprecedented move on our part. I mean, we haven't really tried anything like this, I think, since Castro, maybe. Uh, and, and so that escalation is important. And he also, while this may be a moral and tactical victory in some ways, we still don't understand the strategy behind it, whether there is a broader three-dimensional chess that's likely to be played out by the U.S. military in the region with allies and with support that we're going to desperately need in that situation. And our alliances aren't what they used to be, Correct. let us point out. John and Dan, if I might ask you, I'll start with you, John, first. Uh, what would a proportional response on the part of Iran potentially look like? Uh, and and it'll be the same question for you, Dan, uh, after John finishes. What would it look like? And, and do you expect Iran to retaliate against uh, installations, infrastructure, or American people and personnel? Well, uh, there's a lot of options that Iran has. I mean, the United States has allies and partners all over the region. It has military forces all over the region. It has military installations all over the region. And let's just be clear. Like, Iran has a vast cyber capability that has, has been used to strike both American military uh, as well as American civilian targets in the past. And so it's one of those ones where they have a vast number of options, and I think they're probably considering their options right now. I think the question that we all sort of need to sort of think a little bit about is, I think the Trump administration surprised a lot of people in the region and a lot of people in Washington with what they've done today. So the question is not just what, the, what Iran will do next, but what the United States will do to counter that reaction, because that is, I think, one of the things that we have probably spent a little less time worrying about, and to a degree is a big additional factor of risk, because I think mm -hmm. one of the things that we have not been able to get our heads around is how Donald Trump's been making decisions here and what his next move will be. Uh, Daniel, I'll come back to Ron in just a sec. Daniel, your thoughts on, on how uh, uh, Iran is likely to retaliate? I mean, I would say that, you know, you asked what would be the parallel to what uh, mm -hmm. the killing of Soleimani is. I mean, to be honest, it would be killing Mike Pence. 
um, it would be targeting the number two in the United States. Now, that's not obviously going to happen. Um, and I don't think you're going to see retaliation on, on, in that way. What you're going to see is that Iran's sort of power projection is much greater in the region than it is elsewhere, although their cyber capabilities, as John said, is relatively significant. I suspect that what you will see is a full-spectrum response by Iran. Um, they will target facilities in the Persian Gulf. They will target U.S. assets in Iraq. They will engage in, in various cyber uh, activities. They won't, you know, it, it, with the idea of, of anything short of a full-blown conventional war, which is the one thing that neither uh, the Trump administration nor uh, the Iranian government seems to want. But I would also add, seconding John's point, we, what we also don't know, the, other, the true unknown here is just how prepared the administration is for whatever Iran's counter moves are. Um, you know, it's worth bearing in mind that, that at this point we still don't have, the Trump administration still doesn't have um, a confirmed director of national intelligence. There hasn't been a DNI that's been confirmed for, I think, close to six months at this point. Um, so there's a way in which this has happened and this has escalated where the Trump administration's national security team is still in some ways in flux. Yeah. Ron, final thought. Uh, real quick, I think you know there, there are parts that we haven't talked about yet, which is that China and Russia are not just tacit backers of Iran. We have a signing with China coming up on January 15th of the phase, phase one trade accord. Secretary Pompeo last night said they informed China after the airstrike. So whether or not you know we have properly prepared not only our allies but our adversaries for moves like this is an open question, and it could affect the outlook for our relations with China, certainly with Russia, although it, it, it depends on how you view the Trump administration in that regard. But it could disrupt some of these other negotiations, more germane to the market in a certain sense than, than geopolitical risk. There may also be economic risks down the road that haven't been fully factored in quite yet. All right, Ron, John, Daniel, thank you very much. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, coming up, oil is moving higher today. What this escalation with Iran could mean for the overall oil market. Plus, Apple above $300 a share within pennies of its all-time high. And now analysts are getting even more bullish. Can this stock continue to rock? We'll be right back. Fitness enemy number one. So don't just run, run, run. Makes it up, skip, run, skip, run. Give yourself a lift, makes, makes it up, lift, makes it up, run, lift, splash, skip, lift, run. It's crunch time, skip, makes, makes it up, run, makes it up. Add a boxing class, skip, run, splash, skip, run. Mix it up at Virgin Active and get stronger, fitter, faster. Join now for 12 months and pay nothing in January. T's and C's apply. Run, mix, mix it up, skin, mix it run, mix it, mix it. This is not a cat. This is not a rocket. And this is not a sale. That's right. At Smarty Mobile, we're not having a sale. While others are slashing prices, we're introducing our best ever new plans. Take our new 30 gig data SIM for just £10 a month. With unlimited calls and texts and no speed restrictions, credit checks or contract tying you down, why shop around? New plans, great value. Now that's Smarty. Grab yours today. Search Smarty Mobile. See smarty.co.uk for terms. I used to be a bit of a rubbish sleeper. I'd toss and turn all night. And somehow, I could never find the comfy bit of the mattress. <laughs> it was a proper nightmare. And that's what brought me here, testing mattresses in the Witch Test Lab. We use a custom-made barrel rolling machine to simulate a decade's worth of use. And the mattresses that perform best are the only ones we recommend for your bedroom. Witch tests harder, so you can buy smarter. Visit witch.co.uk. When you're not listening to your team, take it to the end zone, the rim, or the net. Keep up with the biggest moments in sports by following TuneIn on social media. Block, hook, into the end zone for the touchdown. From reminders of the live top games to tips of the best sports stations and podcasts. Welcome to Undisputed. We are live from Los Angeles. I'm Jenny Taft here with Skip Bayless. Follow and tune in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to get the most out of TuneIn. In case you didn't know, TuneIn lets you listen to the same radio stations you pick up on your home or car radio, except you can hear them from anywhere. If you want to find a station from somewhere else in the world, navigate to the By Location section under Browse. Keep exploring with TuneIn. You might already know that TuneIn allows you to listen to all the pro sports leagues wherever you go. But did you know TuneIn is also home to the wide world of college sports? Open 3, DeAndre Hunter got it! 
Hand off Carruthers. Big hole right side. He leaps and he surges in. Touchdown. From live college football, basketball, and baseball games to podcasts and coaches shows fueling your love for the game and your school. And the best part is it's all free. Search college sports to find your team or league. Welcome back to Power Launch. I'm Mike Santoli at the New York Stock Exchange. Apple fighting to buck the market sell-off today after not one, but two price target increases. Bank of America and RBC Capital both getting more bullish on Apple, even with those shares less than 1% from all-time highs. Let's bring in the Trading Nation team to discuss it. Bill Baruch of Blue Line Capital and Chad Morganlander of Washington Crossing Advisors. Bill, um, obviously an incredibly strong uptrend. It's one year to the day since they had a terrible profit warning. The stock fell uh, to in the 140s. It's up more than 100%. The only question is, has it gone too far at this point to the upside? Not yet. I have a price target of 324 out there for Apple, and I noted that here last week. But this chart is, is really great, and what I'm also looking at is the ADX. Look at the ADX, which shows how strongly a, a chart is trending, whether directionally up or down. Peak last year in September. We've had lower peaks since then. It actually just broke out of a trend line on the ADX, and I think there's room to extend. That's going to pave a path to least resistance higher. So again, I, I think Apple, 324 is my target. It's a nice floor at 255. Look for pullbacks as buying opportunities. And Chad, I mean, the strength in Apple really reflects um, investors flocking to a handful of very large, very, uh, I guess, well-regarded tech companies that have these long-term cash flows people think are going to be there forever. Uh, how would you approach the group? So, uh, you know, this outperformance over the last 12 months for the tech sector, up 50%. Valuations are somewhat stretched with a forward-looking PE multiple for XLK of roughly about 22 times. So we would be either neutral to underweight the group. Uh, we believe that even with global growth, even if it does reaccelerate, which we don't believe will happen, then uh, this we would stay shy away. If you're looking for a value companies within the tech sector, look no further than Oracle and Cisco. Both of those companies are trading at about 11 times enterprise value uh, to, to EBIT, which is remarkably cheap based off of the their expected and embedded growth rates. All right. Uh, yeah, and uh, Apple and Microsoft, about 40% of that XLK helping that valuation uh, get stretched to the upside. Bill and Chad, thanks very much. For more Trading Nation, head to our website or follow us on Twitter at Trading Nation. Tyler, back over to you. All right, Michael, thank you very much. And ahead on Power Launch, oil is higher today, uh, really modestly so, really, uh, as tensions between Iran and the U.S. flare up. We will bring you the closing numbers next. Plus, to IPO or not, unicorns like Uber and Lyft had a tough time in 2019. So will this year mark a turnaround or be more of the same? Plus, we're in the final stretch of the CNBC stock draft, if you can believe it. Nick Lowry. Nick the Kick has taken the lead. We will take a look at the stocks that got him there and talk to him personally. All this when Power Lunch returns. And now, the latest from TradingNation.CNBC.com and a word from our sponsor. Volatility spikes are notoriously difficult to forecast, but when they do occur, they tend to be relatively short-lived. So rather than try and predict the next spike, instead consider positioning your portfolio for when volatility comes back down. I'm Joanna Payne, and Schwab is the better place for traders. Okay. Hear every play of the NFL playoffs live with the NFL on TuneIn Premium. Wild Card Weekend kicks off Saturday at 4.35 Eastern when the Buffalo Bills travel south to take on the Texans in an AFC showdown in Houston. The action continues at 8.15 as the AFC East champion Patriots host the Titans in New England. On Sunday, listen live beginning at 1.05 as the Vikings and Saints square off in New Orleans, followed by the Seahawks and Eagles at 4.40 in Philadelphia. The excitement of the NFL playoffs is on TuneIn Premium. Upgrade today. Smart Sports Wagering Talk is now on TuneIn. This is Brett Musburger. The Better Network is now on TuneIn. Search B-E-T-R. Be better informed. Be better prepared. And remember, cash and tickets is what it's all about. 
A lot of people aren't aware that TuneIn lets you listen to the same terrestrial stations that you pick up on your FM AM dial. Except you can hear them from anywhere. To see all the stations broadcasting in your area, find the local radio section on the home screen. Keep it local with TuneIn. When you're not listening to your team, take it to the end zone, the rim, or the net. Keep up with the biggest moments in sports by following TuneIn on social media. From reminders of the live top games to tips of the best sports stations and podcasts. Welcome to Undisputed. We are live from Los Angeles. I'm Jenny Taft here with Skip Bayless. Follow and tune in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to get the most out of TuneIn. Pascal gobbles up the rebound and slams it down. Catch your favorite NBA team right here on TuneIn. A step back, D3 is up and in. Search NBA on TuneIn and hear all the action. The NBA lives on TuneIn. We can't make traffic move faster during rush hour. (laughs) But we can help you catch up on the news with TuneIn. With live around-the-clock news from MSNBC. In the UK, they're significantly worse. When the president gets up to the podium. CNBC and Fox News Talk. The Fox News poll sizing up the race for 2020 found that each of the five top Democrats... You can use your stop and go for good by staying in touch with the world. Search news to hear what's happening now. This is not a commercial. This is a reminder. With TuneIn Premium, you could be listening to more music commercial-free. Get over 45 commercial-free music stations. Visit TuneIn.com slash premium to upgrade. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Sue Herrera. Here's your CNBC News update at this hour. The U.S. says it is sending nearly 3,000 more Army troops to the Mideast in the aftermath of the killing of Iran's top general, Qasem Soleimani. They are in addition to about 100 soldiers who were deployed to Kuwait earlier this week. New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio says the NYPD is increasing security at critical infrastructure points throughout the city. While there are no specific threats, the city remains the top terror target in the country. The fact is we are dealing this morning with a reality we've not faced previously. And it's very, very important for everyone to understand that. And to understand that in these changing circumstances, the city of New York and the NYPD are acting immediately to ensure that New Yorkers are safe. A man stabbed two people, one fatally, inside a restaurant during a violent string of attacks at a shopping plaza in Austin, Texas. The attacks began with an assault at a coffee shop and ended with the suspect leaping off the roof. Police say they don't know what provoked those attacks. The suspect was taken to a local hospital. You are up to date. That's the news update, Court. I'll send it back to you. Sue, thank you. We're going to take a look at where we stand right now. We are off the lows of the day, but stocks still under pressure. All four of the major indices are lower, with the Dow down more than 200 points. The Nasdaq Composite is off just six-tenths of a percent. And time now for today's power movers. Tesla hitting an all-time high after reporting it delivered 367,000 cars last year, meeting the aggressive number set by Elon Musk. Insight falling after the company's drug for bone marrow transplants failed to meet the goal of a trial. At least seven brokerages have cut price targets on that stock, Insight Pharma. And finally, Lamb Weston, it makes and sells frozen potatoes. Not lamb, potatoes. Earnings coming in 10 cents a share above the estimate. The company also raising its guidance. The stock on pace to close at a record high at 93.37 or above. Court? What a day for a potato company. Yes. Well, the oil market is closing for the day. It's been an important one today. Let's go to Dominic Chu. He's at the CNBC Commodity Desk. Hi, Dom. All right, so Courtney Tyler is certainly a focal point for traders. U.S. crude price is set to close near the highs of the session, but it's been a relatively tight trading range so far today. Investors try to handicap the prospects of reduced supply if military actions escalate in the Middle East. West Texas Intermediate closing right now the day at an eight-month high. You can see there's $63.03. That's lifting shares of U.S. shale producers higher as well. Important to note, though, to put 
into some perspective, especially for Brent, the world benchmark price, trading right around 69 bucks a barrel. That's still about 8% below the peak of $75 a barrel that we saw back in April. We'll continue to watch that energy space overall, as well as safe haven assets as we head into that final hour of trading. Now I'll send things, Tyler, back over to you. All right, Dom, thank you very much. So how much higher can oil go as tensions rise in the Middle East? Bob McNally is founder and president of Rapidan Energy Group, as well as a former energy advisor to President George W. Bush. And Kevin Book is managing director with Clearview Energy Partners. Welcome to both of you. Uh, Bob, let me just start with you. Good afternoon. Are you in any sense surprised that, that oil has not reacted uh, more dramatically today than it has? Uh, happy here, Tyler. No, not really that surprised. Uh, the market has gotten pretty complacent. After all, we had uh, the biggest spike after the most biggest attack on an oil facility ever in mid-September, and that quickly unwound as the damage was seen to be light and reversible. And while we have to wait to see after Iran completes the mourning period and calibrates and conducts its retaliation, I think the market's taken the view that Iran is sane enough not to uncork uh, you know, a Gulf War by retaliating directly against U.S. soldiers, bases, and vessels, which now President Trump has shown. Uh, for that, he will impose a high cost. So I think the market is uh, sort of taking it in stride pretty well so far. Kevin, same question to you. Are you surprised that oil has not reacted more dramatically than it did? And to follow on what Bob just said, what kind of Iranian retaliation would cause oil to react very dramatically. Uh, Tyler, hi, and Happy New Year to you. I, I think, uh, first of all, the market is probably not pricing in uh, the realities of, of what could go wrong uh, adequately, and the reasons for that are fundamental in nature. There's about 2.9 billion barrels in OECD inventories, about where it was last November, the November before. Uh, you've got 1.1 million barrels per day of supply ahead of demand in the first half of the, the year by our projection, and that might even be conservative. And you've got 3.1 million barrels per day of spare capacity, at least notionally, uh, two-thirds of which is in Saudi, so maybe not so spare. But when you think about what, uh, what we're really talking about here, the, the kinds of escalations that, that fall outside of betting on Iranian restraint uh, and, and U.S. Uh, rationality, those, those kinds of escalations get into to targets that, that could be producing targets in the region. Uh, targets like the Strait of Hormuz, oil transit routes. It doesn't look like Iran's ready yet to target U.S. troops, as Bob said, but cyber attacks can be incredibly disabling and also disabling to, to the operations and business systems of producers. All those things can move barrels off the market. Bob, we were discussing a bit in our last several segments, of course, about the ripple effects of all of this. What does this move potentially signal to some of our adversaries? We talked about Russia a bit, but what about North Korea? Well, I think North Korea and Moscow and even China are, are uh, dialing down a little bit their willingness to take on Donald Trump. Again, I think everybody was surprised that Donald Trump personally authorized uh, the assassination of Qasem Soleimani. Um, until then, Donald Trump has been showing a, a marked unwillingness to use military force and to confront Iran and so forth. I think China is sitting back and loving it. They love the idea of the United States getting enmeshed in a quagmire. I think Russia, same thing. I think Kim Jong-un may have some second thoughts about provoking Donald Trump again, though. Again, again, Donald Trump uh, acted a little bit out of character here uh, last night, and I think everyone's taking that into account. Because he has certainly uh, staked his uh, part of his political uh, appeal on the idea that he was going to uh, go for peace and prosperity and reduce uh, foreign interventions. Uh, Kevin, let's talk about what this could mean uh, in terms of our allies, uh, whether it's Great Britain or Berlin or Paris or or Brussels, and and the and the possible impact that that these actions could have on Iran pulling further away from the. Uh, the uh, nuclear agreement and reinvigorating its nuclear program. Well, Iran had threatened in November that it would take yet another step back from the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, that 2015 nuclear deal that the U.S. withdrew from uh, in, in 2018. And that's due to happen, based on their calendar, tomorrow. Uh, maybe it won't be tomorrow, but maybe it'll be soon. And it'll test the Europeans who have really said, well, we don't want you to, to do bad things, but please don't give up the deal. It's been a, a stance that reflects really the vulnerabilities they have, not just to missiles that are within Iran's missile range for conventional warheads, but also migrants. Another war in the Middle East 
puts a big stress on the fabric of the European institutions that have trouble in absorbing migrants in the past. So when you, when you think about their reticence, there's a real test coming up. And if Iran decides to move on two fronts, retaliation against assets in the region uh, and also potentially on the nuclear front, does it push Europe closer to the U.S. position? That's a calculation they'll have to be making when they contemplate what to do next. In other words, the Europeans might pull out of the, of the uh, JCPOP or whatever its uh, acronym is. They've threatened to do so. Now, it's a, it's a long, slow walk for them. It could be as little as 15 or 30 days, according to the UN Resolution 2231. Mm -hmm. But in practice, they're likely to slow walk it because they're not in a rush to leave. All right. Kevin Book, thanks very much. Bob McNally, always great to see you guys. Happy New Year and best to you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Mm -hmm. Well, 2019 was supposed to be the year of the big IPO, but the results didn't match up that hype as some big-name unicorns flopped. Will less hoopla lead to bigger returns this year? At our lunch, we'll be right back. We're going to ask that question. The Bond Report. You might already know that TuneIn allows you to listen to all the pro sports leagues wherever you go. But did you know TuneIn is also home to the wide world of college sports? Open three, DeAndre Hunter got it! Hand off Carruthers, big hole right side. He leaps and he surges in, touchdown! From live college football, basketball, and baseball games to podcasts and coaches shows fueling your love for the game and your school. And the best part is, it's all free. Search college sports to find your team or league. We can't make traffic move faster during rush hour. But we can help you catch up on the news with TuneIn. With live around-the-clock news from MSNBC. In the UK, they're significantly worse. When the president gets up yeah. to the podium... CNBC got... and Fox News Talk. The Fox News poll sizing up the race for 2020 found that each of the five top... You can use your stop and go for good by staying in touch with the world. Search news to hear what's happening now. Hockey fans, the 2019-20 NHL season is here. Here's Petrangelo, he scores! And you can hear the action live on TuneIn Premium. And a move, and a shot, From regular season action to the All-Star game and through the Stanley Cup in June. Hear the home and away call for every game, for every team live. At home or on the go, never miss a game with the NHL on TuneIn Premium. Upgrade today. NFL playoffs are here. Make sure you don't miss a minute of this year's postseason action by setting a reminder on TuneIn. Just make sure notifications are allowed on your phone and search for your team on the TuneIn app. Find the game you want to hear and tap Notify Me. We'll send you an alert just in time for kickoff. Hello, I'm Nat Coombs from ESPN's The Nat Coombs Show, which admittedly is 1 out of 10 for original podcast name, but 10 out of 10 for NFL chat. Every week, we're dropping four episodes with an all-pro lineup of terrific guests, journalists, comedians, players, coaches, you name it, all getting you up to speed with everything gridiron. The Nat Coombs Show, American football, British accent. Add to your favorites and listen on TuneIn. The NBA is on TuneIn Premium. Each week, TuneIn picks an NBA game you just can't miss. Hard pulls back, trying to make it 11 to 2. The Pelicans are taking on the Lakers in Los Angeles for the first time since the big offseason trade, sending Anthony Davis to LA. Today, the Pelicans are at the Lakers. Tip off is at 10 30 p.m. Eastern. Search NBA on TuneIn to follow your favorite NBA team today. 2019 was a rough year for big unicorns that went public. Lyft, Uber, Smile Direct, all down big since their debuts. But despite these laggards, IPO stocks in general did outperform the overall S&P, and it was a good year for the overall S&P. So what should we expect from the IPO market now in 2020? With us now, Santos Rao. He's head of research at Manhattan Venture Partners. And Kathy Smith, she's manager of the IPO ETF at Renaissance Capital. Santos, I will start with you. So we kind of gave a very quick rundown of what we saw in that IPO market 
in 2019. A lot of ripple effects to be certain. What carries over into 2020? Some disappointment or some euphoria about what's to come? Yeah, I think overall uh, there'll be some good takeaways into 2020. I think the market will be more rational. The expectations will be more rational in terms of valuations. So I think uh, Uber and Lyft, while they were disappointing post-IPO, uh, uh, overall, I think they did a favor to the market. Uh, I think uh, the market now expects good companies uh, that have a path to profitability. Growth at any cost is not uh, a given. You cannot do that. So you have any new company coming into the market has to check two boxes, which is they have a path to profitability. If Even if they're not profitable, that's fine. A nice, clear path to profitability. And the corporate governance structure has to be very good. Uh, you can't just throw anything out there. So I think all those things are very good. I think it's going to rationalize the IPO market. I think that seems to make a lot of sense. Sort of a path to profitability doesn't seem so ridiculous to expect that <laughs> and expect that relatively soon. Kathy, there are a lot of names perhaps that may be coming what would you be most anticipating at this point in 2020 for the IPOs? Well, we're going to look for quality over quantity. So we'd like to see another year just like we finished up this year where investors do well with IPOs and the market is discerning about valuation and quality. And that's going to be the way every deal will be looked at. And we are going to have a lot of choices. There are a huge number of companies, not only these large VC-backed unicorns, but we're seeing some major PE-backed companies like Reynolds Consumer. We're seeing uh, spinoffs. For example, GE Healthcare could be one of the largest IPOs of the year. And of course, all eyes are going to be on Airbnb, one of the most highly valued unicorns that we're expecting to see come to market early this year and possibly try to come in a more unconventional way using a direct listing. Santos, you mentioned governance as one of the things that you want to drill down on this year particularly. How do you do that? How does an investor do that I mean, you in just, real time? <laughs> I mean, you read the S1 and make sure the voting rights are uh, not disproportionate to what it should be. You can't have 20 to 1 voting rights and 10 to 1. So preferably closer to 1 to 1. That's ideal. Uh, so that's what you want. And there has to be accountability. Uh, make sure there is no self self-dealing going on or appearance of self-dealing in terms of the structure. So I think there has to be some checks and balances. You need to read the S-1, make sure that, you know, it's it's uh, proper. It's clean. It's clean. Yeah. Kathy, you mentioned direct listing. Do you think that we'll see much more of that in 2020 than we've seen in the past? Well, we see a big push for direct listings because there are so many companies that are locked into the private market that are challenged to get public liquidity. And the direct listings appears to be a panacea for these investors, or these VCs and private investors, because they're thinking that, well, we can get the highest price possible and we don't need to have locked up shares. We can sell our shares right away. So insiders can sell at the highest price possible. But what they're missing is that there's another side to this market where investors need to make money. And the two direct listings, the large ones that we've seen so far, both Spotify and Slack have not performed well. And so we think that it may not be the most uh, beneficial kind of structure. In particular, we believe that the lockup is a constructive design because investors, they don't want to see insiders selling before they've seen how the insiders or how the company is going to do in terms of the promises they made in their couple of quarterly announcements. So we want to see shares held back till investors see the performance of the company. So that is going to be a very interesting dynamic in the IPO market in 2020. We're going to leave it there, but hope that you'll keep helping us watch this as we move forward because the year is just beginning. Santos Rao, Kathy Smith, thank you for being here with us. Thank you. All righty, with four weeks left, Nick Lowry is making a strong bid to become a back-to-back -back stock draft champion. But Noah Syndergaard, I think he's still with the Mets, I, I think so, is hot on his heels. Coming up, we'll ask Mr. Lowry if he's worried about a late-inning comeback from Thor. We'll also get Nick the Kicks picks for the NFL playoffs, which kick off tomorrow. Stay with us. This is the investing book. Hello, I'm Nat Coombs from ESPN's The Nat Coombs Show, which admittedly is 1 out of 10 for original podcast name, but 10 out of 10 for NFL chat. Every week, 
We're dropping four episodes with an all-pro lineup of terrific guests, journalists, comedians, players, coaches, you name it, all getting you up to speed with everything Gridiron. The Nat Coombe Show, American football, British accent. Add to your favorites and listen on TuneIn. Want TuneIn to remind you when the big NFL game is about to get underway? Be sure notifications are allowed on your phone and search NFL on the TuneIn app. Find the game you want to hear under events and tap Notify Me. We'll let you know exactly when it's time to listen in for kickoff. We can't make traffic move faster during rush hour. But we can help you catch up on the news with TuneIn with live around-the-clock news from MSNBC. In the U.K., they're significantly worse. When the president gets up yeah. to the podium... CNBC got- and Fox News Talk. The Fox News poll sizing up the race for 2020 found that each of the five top... Demo- you can use your stop and go for good by staying in touch with the world. Search news to hear what's happening now. Hey, NFL fan, can't watch the game? Can't be there? No biggie. Hot. With your TuneIn Premium membership, you already have an all-access pass to every team and every game in the league. Amazing, right? Steps up, floats it towards at the goal line, it's intercepted! Listen live as the action unfolds, or on demand when you can. Anytime, anywhere, all season long. Right side, it is caught, it is in for the right side for the touchdown. Again. Search NFL today. This is not a commercial. This is a reminder. With TuneIn Premium, you could be listening to more music commercial-free. Get over 45 commercial-free music stations. Visit TuneIn.com slash premium to upgrade. Pascal gobbles up the rebound and slams it down. Catch your favorite NBA team right here on TuneIn. A step back, D3 is up and in. Search NBA on TuneIn and hear all the action. The NBA lives on TuneIn. All right, just four more weeks, believe it or not, until we crown our 2019 stock draft champion, the former NFL kicker Nick Lowry, who is the reigning champ, uh, is currently on top once again, up more than 40%, followed by New York Mets pitcher Noah Syndergaard and the mentalist Oz Perlman. With us now to talk about his draft playbook is Nick Lowry. Nick, welcome. Good to have you with us. And a reminder, the stock draft ends at the market close four short weeks from today. One of the things that is the lesson of this year's draft to me, Nick, is the following. Two years ago, Charles Way, New York Giants football player, had AMD as his number one pick. It was not the year for AMD. It's sometimes not so much what you buy, but when you buy it. You got AMD right on the timing as well as the company. Well, most people would have said to not do it two years in a row. Uh, But uh, I really actually love seeing what's going on with oil and gas and the worry about that with the uh, assassination of the uh, Iranian general um, because it brings to the point that AI and data analytics are the new industry. The new Industrial Revolution 4.0 is no longer about um, gold and oil. Uh, It's about AMD, Microsoft, NVIDIA. Microprocessing is the engine that will drive the ability of companies, first of all, to identify the patterns of behavior to please their clients and then to improve productivity right in the moment. That's so that's important, an interesting and that's way only to, gonna get bigger. That's an interesting way to think about it, i.e. data is the commodity, or are the commodity, and the companies that learn how to use the data, the correlate mm-hmm. would be the, the, the oil companies and the processors are the ones that can profit from it. Let's turn, if we might, to the, to the thing that's most immediate, and that is the NFL playoffs. You were the <laughs> greatest kicker in the history of the Kansas City Chiefs. I'm going to bet you like you. the Chiefs to move through the first round and maybe even all the way. Well, it's all about, just like timing uh, it referred to with stocks, it's about the stock of the Kansas City Chiefs playing so well with their defense finally coming to the fore the last six weeks. So I like them. I think Lamar Jackson is great. In fact, I would say Patrick Mahomes and Lamar Jackson are the AMD and NVIDIA of the <laughs> NFL. Uh, and I think that uh, it's probably going to be 
uh, New Orleans over San Francisco just because New Orleans has been robbed so much emotionally. They're going to use that, and they have more experience in the big games. And, I, and frankly, Drew Brees, it's his time to be appreciated the way he deserves to be. All right, interesting call there. So we're looking for New Orleans, Kansas City, Super Bowl. Nick, thanks very much. We appreciate it. Thank you, and I want to I want to thank uh, Toby Smith from Transformity uh, Research, my partner, because uh, he's really helped as well. Uh, fantastic, uh, and we'll see you soon. Continued good luck. Check please is next. Boredom, fitness enemy number one. So don't just run, run, run. Mix it up, skip. Run, skip, run. Give yourself a lift. Mix, mix it up, lift. Mix it up, run, lift. Splash, skip, lift, run. It's crunch time. Skip, mix, mix it up, run. Mix it up. Add a boxing class. Skip, run. Splash, skip, run. Mix it up at Virgin Active and get stronger, fitter, faster. Join now for 12 months and pay nothing in January. T's and C's apply. Run, mix, mix it up, skip. Give same old a shake-up. Give it some gusto. Give your four-dish repertoire the 40-dish treatment with all the ingredients you need delivered to your door. Give it new flavors to try, like creamy haddock linguine with tomato and chili. Give everybody a hearty plateful from just £2.98 each. Give it weekly dinners sorted. Go on, give it some gusto. Visit gusto.co.uk today and get 50% off your first box. Subscription auto renews cancel any time. Hey, NFL fan, can't watch the game? Can't be there? No biggie. With your TuneIn Premium membership, you already have an all-access pass to every team and every game in the league. Amazing.